First we have a, a quorum. Can I call the meeting to order? And I declare the meeting open to, well, we normally declare it open to the public, but we shouldn't actually have any public here uh, today. Uh, can I welcome the chair via Skype and advise that Sinead Bradley is engaging via the live stream online and will email questions to the clerk following uh, the briefings, which the clerk will put on her behalf. And I want to also acknowledge at this stage that um, uh, Sinead, this is her last day um, at Health Committee, that she's moving on, and uh, I want to acknowledge her contribution to her, her time on the Health Committee, so thank you to Sinead. So, um, I also want to uh, welcome Pat Sheenan, he's not here as yet, and we don't have an apology from him, but uh, this will be his first meeting, and I know he was a previous member of the Health Committee in the past. So, in terms of the public session, uh, can I remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? May I advise those in the public gallery uh, that mobile devices may be used through a Wi-Fi connection and that all devices should be muted. Password details are set out in the gallery rules for anyone wanting to connect to the assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G should not be used and no recordings or photographs are to be taken. Moving on to apologies, members, um, I have received apologies from Orlea and from Alex. Uh, members, aware of any other apologies? Okay, thank you. So, moving on to uh, Chairperson's business, and just to say that the Chair and I continue to be in contact with the Minister, and uh, I was speaking to the Minister this morning and have been given assurance that um, every effort is being made to ramp up the testing for COVID-19. I know you're all <coughs> not. Um, another issue is um, the uh, chair and I met with um, the Royal College of GPs um, last week on issues arising from COVID-19. And uh, can I advise members that we're exploring options to facilitate further remote participation meetings and distancing of those physically present. So moving on to draft minutes. Um, I'm sorry, I'll just take a moment to check. Colm, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you okay, Colm, yeah. That's great, thank you. Uh, so moving on to the draft minutes, item three, I refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 5th of March, which are at tab 3.1 of the meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, that's great. And moving on then to four, the matters arising. May I advise members that there are no matters arising. Uh, and that takes us on to five, and the College of Podiatry briefing on current issues. And just to advise members that the College of Podiatry have sent apologies for today's meeting due to current circumstances. And uh, we'll seek a new date for that session in due course. And the papers included at tab five will be retabled at that time. Okay, so we're moving on to six, which is the COVID-19 disease response. And just to remind members that the committee agreed to add the COVID-19 disease response as a standing agenda item for the forthcoming period. There will be an opportunity to discuss our next steps, next steps later in uh, the meeting, but first may I advise members that representatives from the care sector are here today to brief the committee on the situation in the care home and domiciliary care sector with regard to COVID-19. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So may I welcome Ms. Pauline Shepherd, Chief Executive of the Independent Health and Care Providers, and Ms. Agnes Lunny, Chief Executive of Positive Futures. So you're very uh, welcome to today's health committee. Uh, Glad to have you here under these very difficult circumstances and I appreciate the time you've given. So I would like to invite you to brief us okay. and then we'll take some questions. I think I'm going to go first. Yes, thanks, Paul. Um, thank you very much for the invite. Um, yes, a bit about IHCP, just briefly, first of all. Um, we represent independent providers of care, home and domiciliary care services. Members include private, not-for-profit, charity and church-affiliated <laughs> organisations. And the independent sector provides almost 15,000 of the 16,000 care home beds and 70% of the domiciliary care services in Northern Ireland. You've probably already been uh, receiving briefings about the pressures facing the sector and the fact that the services have been fragile for some time. 
The coronavirus crisis on top of an already fractured system is not a good position to be in, particularly given that we have the most vulnerable and susceptible people within our service and within our care. However, the historical problems are not what I'm here to talk about today. I would like an opportunity at a future date, however, to highlight the, the historical issues, particularly the, the urgent need for an independent economic review for the sector. That said, we are keen to work with the health and social care system and are fully committed to doing our very best to have good systems and processes in place and to work in partnership to find solutions to problems, but this requires flexibility and relaxation of the current bureaucracy. We have a number of concerns arising from the COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm just really going to list those. We need timely and consistent guidance applied by and across the trusts, PHA, RQIA and the Department of Health. Questions need to be answered promptly. There needs to be a 24-7 answer service and clear points of contact. Urgent, bold decision making is required, balancing risks with protection of life, clear and, decision, uh, clear and decisive instruction. The staffing impact now that there's been an announcement about the school's closure will significantly impact on our workforce. The workforce will reduce and there will be a further impact from self-distancing, um, self-isolation and indeed fear within the workforce. There is a need to protect employees and to continue to deliver services. To protect staff, we need the necessary personal protection equipment, and we can't get this. Even normal infection control equipment is running short. I'm seriously worried about the personal protection equipment, and I've been pressing for the last two weeks in relation to getting that out into care homes and domiciliary um, care providers. Indeed, just this morning I was advised that um, a care home provider in the Southern Trust is refusing to take any more admissions until they receive the proper PPE. And the example I'll give to you about that is that we have had a number of um, coronavirus scares, one, con one that I'm aware of confirmed within a care home. They don't have the PPE equipment. And when an ambulance arrives, the paramedics are kitted like they're going to the moon. And the, the staff are seriously worried about not having the, the, the right equipment. Um, we need prioritisation of care needs and the allocation of resources across the whole health system. We are all in this together and we need to work together to sort it out. We know that work has been undertaken on surge staffing plans, but have not been engaged in the preparation. We have concerns about the feasibility and mobilisation of these plans, which have not been tested. There's a need for flexibility around regulations, rules and staff responsibilities. We've been asking about changes to NISC registration, uh, uh, RQIA um, inspections. All of those need to be considered. There's liability insurance issues that obviously the statutory sector don't face, but private and um, not-for-profit organisations do. We need to um, have technology to assist with care, and we need there to be there will be business failures. We need plans for handing back work and support for businesses in economic difficulty. We are concerned about the continuity of services both throughout and after the pandemic. We see that there are a lot of small businesses that will not survive and we're concerned in particular around domiciliary care providers. If those small businesses go down, what is going to happen to the people in receipt of domiciliary care? There's an issue about testing of new admissions into care homes. There's no testing being done. Um, it's very vulnerable bringing people from, from hospital who have not been tested into an environment where people are very um, weak and vulnerable. Public expectations are also an issue and the impact of restricted visiting, particularly during the end of life. The impact of restricted visiting or indeed lockdown on elderly, those with dementia and those with learning disabilities. A lot of people who do not understand why their families are not visiting, it will seriously impact. The impact of social isolation, social isolation on elderly and vulnerable people and caring for elderly and vulnerable people who are isolated, living alone with no family, how are they going to be fed and how are they going to be cared for? And the surge plans that are being talked about within the department, because we have an advisability, how do we work with whatever volunteers come along or whatever other people are redeployed from the, the other parts of the health sector? The need to have basic supplies of paracetamol, oxygen and antibiotics. These can't be stored. 
um, in care homes. Only the supplies are there for the people that are actually there. And I've been pressing to say we need to have those stocked up and ready to deal with any issue that comes along. The short and long term economic impact in the sector will be significant. And at the other side of this, there is the critical need to reform adult social care and to do it quickly and to learn from the lessons that we're going to experience in the next months and in the future to have a better social care structure in place. In conclusion, I want to express how important it is for us to work in partnership throughout this period, but that means we must be included in developing plans and testing feasibility and for questions to be answered quickly and decisions made urgently. And to coin a phrase for the sector, never has so few been so ill-equipped to deal with so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Pauline. And uh, some very serious issues there. Just at just this um, juncture, I want to uh, say that the, um, very sadly, the first death of a patient with COVID-19 uh, within Northern Ireland has occurred. Um, uh, we understand uh, the patient was elderly and had serious underlying health conditions, but I just think it's uh, appropriate that we um, recognise that and obviously think of um, those who have been affected, the immediate family um, of that deceased person. I uh, want them to know that thoughts are with them. It's a very difficult time. It just, uh, uh, I think, just makes it even more understandable how serious this issue is. And uh, we do appreciate you being here today. Um, I don't know, Agnes, had, uh, did you want to say anything at this point? Or Yes, uh, if you don't mind, um, again, you know, um, I'm deeply saddened to hear of the death of that person. And it's just, it really does bring home just how serious this issue is and why then it is so important that we all work together um, to ensure that we do the very best we can for the most vulnerable people in our society. Now, I'm not going to repeat what Pauline has said. I think Pauline has very ably articulated a huge range of issues affecting the sector. Yeah. But I'm here today as Chief Executive of Positive Futures, as well as Chair of an organisation called Association for Real Change. The Association for Real Change is an umbrella organisation of providers of services to people with a learning disability across Northern Ireland. The organisation has membership from the voluntary, independent and statutory sectors and the membership is 53 members at the moment so we represent uh, the vast majority of service providers supporting people with a learning disability in Northern Ireland. Positive Futures is uh, an all-Ireland charity and we support people with a learning disability, with autistic spectrum condition and with acquired brain injury and that is right through from childhood to, to late adulthood. Uh, the youngest people we support are still, uh, uh, the youngest is at um, 11 months, the eldest is in, in his 80s. So we're talking about you know, the, the, the entire age range right across the whole region of, of Northern Ireland. I'm not going to repeat the issues that Pauline has, has raised, but I think the committee will be aware of um, uh, uh, concerns I expressed to Colin Gilding, the chair of the committee last Friday. And he worked very swiftly in ensuring that those issues were raised immediately with Robin Swan and with, with Sean Holland. The issues, I still haven't received any responses, and that would be really important. And I know that Pauline has also asked questions of the Department of Health. Now, we appreciate just how busy people are, and we know that people are working around the clock, but we need to communicate. And communication isn't good at the moment. So we need people to communicate, we need people to realise that, that there are organisations like the one Pauline represents and the ones I represent, and we're there to act as conduits to other organisations. So we need to communicate. We need the communication to be simple and we need to be straightforward. And an example of what I mean by simple and straightforward is it's not good enough to say the trusts have PPE equipment. The trusts, you know, that's a faceless organisation. We need communications to include who we contact, and where we get that contact information. So we need names and numbers of people we contact. You know, providers across art and in Positive Futures, we need that information for our staff who are working 24-7 to provide support to people. So that's the first thing. We need that communication to be timely. We need it to be updated on a regular basis. So that is really, really important. In relation to the impact of this on, on, on the people who we support, and again, I don't want to, to in any way um, um, cast dispersions on the knowledge of the people sitting around this table, but I seriously think that people don't really appreciate 
the work that the social care sector does. We support people 24-7, 365 days a year, people whose needs are incredibly complex. Yes, they have, in our instance, people with a learning disability, people with autism, people with acquired brain injury, but they also have medical needs, physical needs, additional medical issues which require very much hands-on support. Now, when we employ our staff, we employ them as support workers. But as this virus takes a grip, are we saying that our support workers are being asked to change their jobs? Are they going to become medical staff? Because we can't walk out on people. So if people get the virus, what is the advice to our staff? Are we saying that staff must continue to come into work and support people, not at a social distance, but absolutely hands-on? And the points that Pauline made about PPE equipment are critical here. We're, we're being told that there is sufficient PPE uh, equipment in Northern Ireland, that a stockpiling has happened in relation to concerns around Brexit. Where is the equipment and how do we get access to it? And how do we get access to it today? Now, when we talk about equipment, we're not talking about what Pauline described as the space suits that ambulance drivers and hospital workers are, 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 are dressed in. But my understanding is that that is the level of protection our staff will need. I also understand that in order to, to, to wear that equipment, you need training. So again, are we actually moving that up the agenda and ensuring, because we, are, we have to plan for worst case scenario. The other issue that the sector is absolutely concerned about is a lot of our contracts, in spite of advances in technology, the monies that our sector uh, receive for, for the provision of services is paid in response to invoices. Now, in the event of, of, of um, impact on, on, on the, the normal running of financial services, we could find ourselves in the voluntary sector with no funding. So I'm urging the committee today to ask that changes are made as a matter of urgency to how we're funded. Most of the work that all our providers do across Pauline's group that she represents and ARC is work that's contracted. There's no risk to the public purse. This, the, 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 the details associated with the, the services we provide are detailed in contracts. We're urging at least quarterly payments in advance so that we can fund our, our services, we can, we can pay our staff. In addition to that, we need a fund available in Northern Ireland to deal with the additional costs. Our organisation yesterday had to buy over 30 new laptops. Now, they're not cheap to buy. We've also had to stock up on all sorts of other equipment. We've had to buy new phones for people because we're having our staff to work from home where they can. We're also having to, to pay additional uh, taxi services, pay people additional mileage to do work over and above what, we're also ex what we've previously expected of them. We need that to happen, and we need that, need that to happen today. In relation to insurance, I know a number of our providers have said that their insurance doesn't cover pandemics. We need to know what government is doing in event that a member of staff claims against a provider. Because we're not, you know, the, these things are, are, are very likely to, to, to occur, so we need some in, information as to how that happens. The other issues are, we need to ensure, as Pauline says, we, we, we're, we're starting from a very, very fragile place. We've had significant workforce issues over the years. We've had significant funding issues over the years. And we need to understand that this, the impact of this is going to be absolutely critical. And we're not needing to be planning for today only. This virus will pass. We need to ensure that whatever we do to our workforce, we ensure that they, are felt, they feel valued. And feeling valued is that they get paid, not sick, sick pay. Sick pay is not going to pay the bills or the mortgages of the people we support. We know that in England there has been mortgage um, rent, free periods, there's been rents and so on. We need to hear those messages coming out from Northern Ireland in exactly the same way. We need, we need there's, there's suggestions around universal credit, there's, there's suggestions around statute of sick pay. We need those decisions to be made and to be made really, really quickly so that our workforce feel valued. They have not felt valued valued over the last number of years and this is going to create, create for them a huge critical scenario. So we need, we need those, those issues um, addressed as, as, uh, um, as, 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 as well. At this point maybe I should stop and see if people have questions for, for us because I guess you know we could talk for a long time because the issues are so wide-ranging but if there's particular things 
that, that, that you need to hear from us. We need to hear what those things are. The point that Pauline made about regulation, we know that you know, regulation dictates how our services are run and how our providers run their services. But we need to change. If things aren't working, we need to change them. And we need to be fleet of foot in changing those things. We need to risk, risk to recognise that in, we may not have have staff who have their registrations up to date. We need our QA to recognise that enhanced police checks take at least 12 weeks. We're not about trying to place people at risk, vulnerable people at risk. We're about trying to do the very best for people. So at most we're asking that, that, that these regulations are, are reduced and that we get permission to recruit our staff on the basis of a basic police check, which we know will come an awful lot more quickly. We're also asking for relaxation to be given to mandatory training. Again, we're not, at, we're not expecting that our staff are going to be providing support who are not trained, but we want uh, the, 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 the system to give credit to the leaders in this sector to make decisions that are the right decisions based on the circumstances that we currently find ourselves in. Sorry, I said I'd stop and I started again. <laughs> That's okay. I fully appreciate it and thank you very much both for, for that uh, briefing. And yes, we're going to open up to um, questions. Um, it, there was a, a statement came out yesterday from the Chief Social Worker, Sean Holland. How, how do you feel about that statement? I mean, it, 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 does, um, it does talk about the PP issue and we know it's a huge issue across um, all the frontline um, healthcare workers, the issue of PPE. But um, he's certainly giving some very specific guidance in terms of um, domicily work, um, for instance. So have you any commentary on, on his statement of yesterday? I have. I was involved in the meeting on Monday okay. and pressing for the guidance. Okay. And I fed into that in the past two weeks, indicating in the past two weeks that the guidance there was no point in putting into it, that providers had to go and source yeah. their own um, PPE because there was none available. I've pushed and I've pushed and said, please cut out the middle processes in this and go and source it within the health and social care sector and have some sort of plan for distribution. Yeah. I went to the meeting, I said my piece, I have emailed, I have done as best I can and still the guidance and still Sean's comments this morning on the radio were trusts have to help yeah. but providers should go and source their own. There are none to source. Yeah. And we are facing people with potential coronavirus in a care home. And last night I was taking calls from a, a domiciliary care provider in South Down who actually had a potential uh, coronavirus case. And the advice to the staff that they gave, we don't have PPE, you double up with your normal masks, you double up with your normal aprons, and you double up with your normal sleeves. But yet whenever somebody came to collect that person, the, the process handing on and handing on to the hospital, they have considerable PPE and I just think it is unfair. And I think it's really quite simple. You know, if, as Sean says, there is PPE, then I think what Pauline's saying, okay, tell us where we get it. It's as simple as that. Let's, let's stop writing war and peace. We, we, we're beyond, you know, writing, you know, detailed policies and procedures. Let's get down to action. Let's just tell us if it has to be collected at a central point, we'll that's fine. It. We'll go and get it. But, you know, let's not jump through hoops to get things. You know, th th this could be, you know, our sons and daughters, our grandparents, our parents. You know, we need to deal with this in a human way and we need to make this easy, not complex. So, uh, just on the back of that then, then, uh, have you contacted the Trust then and, and asked them for that PPE? We well, have, pr sorry, Pauline. No. Uh, we, we have, we have, we have spoken to each of the five trusts last Friday, and we've detailed what our requirements are in relation to PPP. But again, we're not getting simple information coming back. We're being told the trust. We need to know who and where. As sorry, a result Pauline. of emails that I was sending last night back and forth to Sean Holland, um, I'm aware that there have been urgent meetings set up between some providers and trusts this morning because I was being briefed on the way here, but I feel that I've had to nearly climb on the top of the roof to actually get, be heard and to say this needs to be resolved. Yeah. And that's, and I think that's just not acceptable. I think at the very least they can do is actually give you an actual point of contact that you can uh, source this PPE because it's too vital. Um, just another, I'm going to ask you just another question before uh, I hand over to um, Colm, uh, and that's well, you mentioned um, medication, and obviously medication is a, 
uh, it's a big issue and it's a big issue for farms at the minute. They're being they're inundated, they're flat out trying to provide that and the guidance is that there is no need to stockpile. Uh, so I'm just wondering how how you kind of counteract that with, with your call for actually to have a, obviously you want a limited stock just for that it's reassurance. It's not necessarily stockpiling yeah. um, is the issue. There's only enough. We're, we're only we're regulated to the degree where we can only have enough for each individual resident yeah. or each individual client, and therefore you only have for that individual. What we're asking for is additional, so that if somebody has a high temperature at least or needs antibiotics, at least it can be there and then given to them rather than wait for somebody to come along and you know deal with the issues early on so it's not stockpiling it's actually having the additional supply for people who understand and can deal with the situation they don't have the medication to deal with it and we're told that you know the treatment for this is essentially the treatment you would take for for a flu but if paracetamol isn't available it's very difficult for us to start prescribe you know to start administering that medication and the other issue is we in care homes we're not allowed to use one client's medication for another client it can't be crossed over so if you run out for what for one client you cannot lift from somebody else and use it okay thank you um and the final one for me for now uh, have you any plans and obviously there's uh, the issue around regulations and the bureaucracy and uh, here's hoping that um, any legislation to come very soon will will deal with all that and ease pressures uh, but have you any plans for kind of or are you looking at temporary recruitment for increasing the use of volunteers in the social care setting yes uh, we have we have uh, suggested that um, in the in the communication that Colm sent on Friday, I'm still getting uh, waiting for a response to that. But I did say to our QA yesterday that in the absence of a response, I'm going to move to, at the end of this week to basic police checks. And you know, I think at this point we need leadership, leadership, people in leadership roles to to, to be bold and, and 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 to show courage. And I'm prepared to put my neck on the line to 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 do, to do the best with the people we support. And I believe that basic police checks, whilst the enhanced checks are carrying on, is is in my view preferential to people having no staff. The people we support, a, a large number of them live on their own. A large number of them requires two staff, if not three staff. So you know, one staff going off has a major major impact. We need to make sure that the people. Uh, that there is a workforce out there. I mean, we've we've already contacted businesses, including the Woolsey Group, who have paid off 800 staff yesterday morning. We're having to be creative about how we do these things. We're having to be creative about how we do interviews, how we how we pick up references. Now, I will keep all the organisations and bodies uh, updated. But I think you know we we've got as leaders to actually step up to the plate, and I certainly think that the. Two of us in the room today are, are de demonstrating that, and we're prepared to do that. And I think I speak for all of ARC when I say that. Okay. We, we, ha we have difficulty in recruiting, and we've had difficulty for some time. There's been considerable shortages, both of nurses and um, of care staff. So that's why I say we're starting in not a good position. Um, but what, what um, our members are saying is that they have been trying to say, well, we, we've got people now, friends, family, who uh, will be remaining at home um, that don't have a job to go to. Yeah. Can we not use them? Can Absolutely. we not bring them in? And I've been suggesting and saying, you know, we have to get around this issue of registration. Is it not better that we have someone there to actually help someone rather than saying, well, you can't come in because you, you don't have whatever training and you don't have whatever registration. We're not in this situation anymore. This is a different time that we're dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are very common sense um, recommendations. Um, Colin, we're going to come over to you for your questions. There might be a bit of a delay. Well, thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can hear you, Colin. Yeah, uh, first of all, just a record to in my condolences as a family and you know I think it's a sign of the difficult situation that we're in. I have no doubt that health care staff like yourselves why do everything they can in this time. I suppose my question would be do either of you have a, a centre point of contact raise issues of a practical nature as they are raised and the second Part of my question would be, are you aware of a strategy to deal with the uh, development situation in the timing? 
Now, I don't know. I don't think, Colm, I don't think we we're able to make you out, but I think the clerk may have the, the general gist of your question through your emails, which is helpful. So, just to repeat, um, what plans are in place for the independent care sector uh, at this point for ongoing contact to address issues as they arise? Um, and we come to your comment later, then, Colm, your suggestion. Yeah, yeah that's you. the only question I have emailed. I can answer okay. the first one. I, again, I have been trying to work with the Department and the Health and Social Care Board for the last two or three weeks to say there needs to be a single point of contact and a 24-7 service to answer questions. I fed in the list of questions that I get from our members and I fed them in uh, on Friday a week ago and I was assured that if I give those questions they would get answers and have them out last Monday. I've been pressing every day to say where are those questions, we need the questions and answers and I still haven't got them. In addition to that, then um, um, I'm also a, a member of the all-party group on learning disability. And last Thursday, we developed a number of questions which uh, Chris Little put forward to Robin Swan. Um, we were to get a response on Monday. Uh, we're now Thursday. Um, Colm, I know himself, um, delivered questions. I raised them with, with Robin Swan and Sean Holland. As yet, we've had no response. So, um, and again, like Pauline, ARC and Positive Futures are engaged in a whole range of different meetings, which again has taken up an awful lot of energy. Mm -hmm. It would be much, much better if we were to, to find a, a sort of a central, and it's very difficult because we all have different uh, uh, needs, I guess, but I think we need, to, we need to get better at ensuring that there is a representative group who will be responsive, and that means responsive 24-7, because when something happens, we need information now. So I think that that, that 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 is a gap that continues in the system. I say this is not this is not about criticism. This is about just saying this is how it is, and it could be improved. Okay, Colin. Yeah, that's okay. I have a suggestion. Then. Do you want me to read out the suggestion, Colin? Yes, they'll either know. Or at the end. Okay. All right. So, we'll, Jerry, you're next, and then Paula. Yes, thanks, Agnes and Pauline. Um, just a couple of questions. I mean, obviously, the GPs came out. I think it was two days ago, saying they're worried about uh, infection and control masks. And the Marie Curie uh, said they were undersupplied with PPE. Um, and to quote them directly, they said, uh, "Currently, they are currently putting the health of, sta of staff and patients at risk." So. Do you concur that the current situation uh, is, is that, uh, as you indicated? And also, um, do you have an idea of the, the quantity of mask and equipment uh, that we need, at least for the, the social care sector? Um, other question is around uh, testing kits, because I mean, obviously um, we know they're produced here, very close to Belfast, um, but there's a severe lack of testing ongoing. Places like Korea, there was rapid testing, which helped to uh, um, pinpoint where the um, clusters and where people were infected were. Uh, it was in Dublin yesterday, and there was um, a range of measures being taken. Croke Park is being made available for drive-through testing, and it appears to me that the department is not doing enough to ensure testing happens. So, uh, a comment from yourselves uh, on that, please. Um, and also, um, I've been made aware of several people whose partners, um, both coupled, the couples work in the health service. One is at home because they have symptoms, so they might have could be a flu, but it could be it could be COVID nineteen. But both um, partners are at home, so I'm concerned with healthcare workers that are on duty at home um, because they're taking the correct measures, but they may not have COVID nineteen. They are not being tested as well. So that's been obviously a massive strain on families, but also on on our health service. So a comment on that, and, and just finally, I think. Um, it's imperative, in my view, that um, workers are, are supported, they're bailed out, and they're protected in this situation. Um, we've heard measures for businesses, and, and that's obviously important. Um, but workers who are working in the health service in, in all levels, or on temporary contracts, or on zero hour contracts, um, uh, need to be protected. So I think it's something that Agnes you alluded to, uh, but it's something that certainly I would support, and hopefully others as well. Will I go first, Pauline? Yeah. You need to keep me right, Jerry, just because I'll my do memory best, doesn't hold all the information. Um, I suppose the first thing I would say is, as an organisation providing services across all of Ireland, we we have you know first-hand experience of the difference in how both country, both parts of the island are, are dealing with this issue. 
and it, it is easier for us in the Republic of Ireland. The advice seems to be uh, clearer and the fact that there is testing ongoing is, is, is really significant. And I, again, would echo uh, what you're saying. I think we need to get, get uh, testing back into the system. I think we place, you know, we're, we're, we're con continuing to place people at risk, but also I think we're really stretching the service because people have to take action to protect themselves but they, because they don't know whether they've got the infection or not. So I think we've got to think really, really carefully about that. And I would be urging government to, to, to institute testing as a matter of, of, of significant urgency. I think the other issue is about the workers and healthcare workers. I understand this morning that Peter Weir has uh, suggested that schools will remain open for the children of healthcare workers. Let's remember that there is also social care workers and healthcare workers often just means healthcare workers. Now, the great healthcare workers are doing a great job, but social care, you know, the numbers in social care probably outnumber the numbers in healthcare, and we need to ensure that our social care workers are treated in the same way. So let's change the language and talk about health and social care workers. Now, I don't know how that's going to happen, but you're absolutely right. A number of the people we employ, both, both parents are involved in health and social care. So, so I think that's really, really critical. Other, other areas that you, you raised, Jerry, were about um, the, the, um, how we actually ensure that we protect our workers. Yes, there has been a number of issues around businesses and, and protection for, for, for businesses. We need to ensure that that's happening now for workers as well. And you know, I think we need to appreciate statutory sick pay. It's not even £100 a week. That is not going to keep people fed, people who have families. So we need to, 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 to increase those benefits. On the other bit, in terms of providers, I think we need to do, as I said, we need to, as of today, you know, do, uh, engage um, in, in systems that prepay the, the, the sector for the, for the job that, that it's doing. You asked other questions earlier, Jerry, and my memory has missed those. Um, I think you covered most of them, but I think your point on um, financial support is essential because if we're creating economic buyers for people, then they may uh, make the incorrect public health decisions because of buyers in terms of yeah. having to pay rent, having to you know pay bills. So it's important. That and we all uh, suffer, not just the individuals. You know, people are putting absolutely. themselves at risk coming to work when they have an infection or whatever. And I, and I think Agnes, you, you made an important point about um, the South. I was in Dublin yesterday, and I managed to get a quick briefing from the HSE uh, and their recommendations what uh, they say there needs to be a unified approach across the island that would be much more, more simpler and um, I don't think that's happened. I mean there's been a divergent approach north and south and the one in the north has been uh, in my view too aligned with what Boris Johnson is doing which is really bigger. I think this need not to be about politics. I think this is about mm -hmm. human rights and this is about us working together. And I think if we do work together and if we put human beings at the centre of our thinking, I think we'll do a hell of a better job than, than, than making this a, an issue of politics. Can I think just add one point, Jerry, to, and it's around the PPE. And the, 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 for me, the highest risk we have here is in relation to, well, domiciliary care possibly um, is higher than care homes. Um, if the coronavirus gets into a care home, we have group, a large group of very vulnerable people. However, in domiciliary care, if we don't get the PPE, we have um, carers going from one home to another, maybe visiting 17, 18 different, care, or different people in different homes in one day, the families in those. That, to me, is the biggest area where there could be possible transfer risk and yet we don't have the PPE. And what I'd be saying is that right from the beginning of this, we should have been looking at where are our highest risk and most vulnerable areas, and care homes and domiciliary care should have been at the fore. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a very good um, point, Pauline, and um, certainly it also makes the case for testing of health um, workers. And, and early on in the, in the meeting, I had mentioned that I'd spoken to uh, Minister Swan just this morning, and he gave me an assurance that they were doing everything they could to ramp up testing. So that's welcome news, and we would, uh, I'm sure everybody would agree that um, that that has to be made a priority for um, health and indeed health and social care workers, as you've, as you've mentioned. And just on the point, Agnes, um, you talked about the you know, the language and around um, what provision schooling provision would be made available for children of health workers. I am 100% um, sure that includes social workers. It, inc it will include probably other walks of life as well, which will be very essential, like um, you know those involved in um, haulage and delivering of food um, and uh, to police, for instance. So I think there will be probably quite a w wide range of uh, professions that will need to be covered under that. Um, on to Paula. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. Um, I have a series of questions. Um, 
The first one relates to the uh, training and resource daycare centres that are operating, I know certainly in Belfast, I think there's about 10 of them, and I got a, a call from a lady yesterday who, wouldn't, who, who works in one of these, wouldn't give me her name. She's very concerned that the, um, the patients or users of the centres are travelling in the buses, getting there, sitting in rooms of 10, maybe 70 or 80 people in a centre, you say no PPE, no personal intimate <coughs> care equipment, Unfortunately, because of the nature of maybe their learning or physical disabilities, they're not able to wash their hands properly and they're still walking around holding hands and stuff. What would your position be on these daycare centres? Should they be closed at this point or what? It's a really difficult issue, Paula, and that was one of the questions that Colm asked of Colm oh, sorry, asked I didn't of, see of that. Robin Swan last Friday. Okay. The issue is much broader than that, I know. Paula. What, what did they do with them? So we're, we're, what we heard last Thursday was a rumour from the South East Trust allegedly, that they were going to close all of the daycare centres. Yesterday we got a phone call that said that the Belfast Trust were closing all their centres. There's a lot of rumouring going on at the moment mm -hmm. and that's not helpful. Yeah. We discovered that neither of those were correct, neither of those rumours were correct, but there is a sense that it's only days away. Okay. Now, there are risks of people coming to the day centres and those you have articulated, Paula, mm -hmm. and they're absolutely real. The other risk is what happens if the centres close? I know. And what we're being told is if the centres close and the centres are largely run and provided by the statutory sector, that the workers in those centres will be pulled back into the statutory sector to provide services. Now, organisations like ours and many of the members in ARC uh, support people who attend those centres. We're not funded during the daytime when those people are at the centres. Yeah. So from half nine in the morning until half past three, we don't employ staff. Where are we going to magic staff up from to provide that support? Mm -hmm. if the trust are not going to, to, to share out the workers with our sector. The other really critical issue, and I'm not sure anybody's hearing this, over 70% of people who attend, day, people with a learning disability who attend day centres, live at home with their families, many of whom are very elderly. Mm -hmm. The only break those families get is when their sons and daughters or relatives go to the day centres. So who's going to be there to support them? Yeah. So that's a critical issue. These are people who are not actually in receipt of any service. And the service that, you know, the only support they get is because their sons and daughters are part of the service. So we, you know, that, that's an issue that I have raised and I'm really concerned about that mm -hmm. because we know that our older carers are stretched at the moment and our families are stretched, you know, long before this virus kicks in. So I can't answer that yeah. question, Paula, because it's, it's a risk however we look at it. Okay. But I think what I'm asking for is that that's considered. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I actually wrote to the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust and I haven't, I've got a holding email that I haven't yeah. received. But as you say, the information needs to come out there. So I'll just move on a little bit. RQIA inspection of nursing homes, is there, uh, are, is there any information that these are being ramped up? Because if parents, are, or parents and relatives aren't necessarily attending, then... Where are the eyes and the ears and where are people making sure the safeguards are in place for the vulnerable patients? I think that's again back to a balance of risk and actually yeah. making the decision as to what's important, increased inspections. And it is about balancing well, what's more important here, in my view, preservation of life mm -hmm. is the most important and PPE equipment and managing people as best we can. Um, I, I was at a meeting earlier this week in the department and um, Olive McLeod the, from RQIA was there. Uh, there was discussions about what um, relaxations um, there could be in various um, RQIA regulations. That was part of the consideration, but I, I don't know if there's been any decisions or any further discussions. Um, Olive did suggest um, that there, her, some of her staff inspectors could be used as point of contacts mm -hmm. for, um, to answer questions, but again, I don't know what they have done with that information. My understanding is that RQIA did um, put a, a, a paper to the Department of Health yesterday and in it they have made some suggestions about re relaxation of some of the regulations to facilitate what Pauline says, the important issue, which is a matter of life. And I think preserving life is, is what our priority needs to be. Yeah, thank you. Pauline, or sorry, Agnes, you used the phrase urgent decision, bold decisions need to be taken. Can you give us an example of some of those really bold, urgent decisions that you want the Department or Health and Social Care Board to take? Well, I think, I think we've 
articulated yeah, okay. a huge range of those now. Okay. I think things Priority. like being clear about communication, you know, being clear that we're going to, we're going, you know, contact names and numbers, people will be identified with clear roles and responsibilities. We've had to do that in our own organisations. We have our own contingency plans. They're not bland. They're not. It doesn't say contact positive features. It says a named person. Mm -hmm. It says when to do it. It says how to do it. It says a, a range of different contact, you know, ways to contact people. You know, urgently we need the issue of funding to be addressed. Urgently we need issues to do with workers and how workers are going to be protected addressed. Mm -hmm. Urgently we need PPE equipment addressed. Urgently. Okay. You know, so so Thanks, there's a number of things that I think we need to do really quickly, but keep that decision making going as well, Paul, is something that's I think important. for me the bold decisions are around relaxation of the regulations. Okay. And um, the um, uh, are the access NI basic checks and actually you know when you're weighing up the risk of is someone going to be provided care um, against well can we bring in a family member and they don't have a basic check but we know who they are mm -hmm. and they can feed somebody or they can do something those decisions have to be made that if that happens nobody's going to be challenged coming mm -hmm. out the other end of this and we're not going to face an inquiry into who did this and who did that mm -hmm. you know those are the types of things we, that we know we also need. that in the republic of ireland uh, there have been decisions made for example people who have been nurses who are now guards are being allowed to go back into the hospitals to work as nurses now they probably haven't got their nursing registration and they probably haven't got their up-to-date training but we're saying we know we've had a number of people retire over the last couple of years we want to bring those people back they're competent you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's those sorts of decisions, as Pauline says, that that's really going to be important. Thank you, and thank you for the work you're doing on this. It's so critical. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Alan? Yeah. It's, uh, it is a fast-moving situation. It's an unprecedented situation. I was just listening a couple of nights ago. Someone sent me um, a lecture that Bill Gates gave. Uh, to a health organisation back in 2015, and he articulated that you know, the greatest threat in the world wasn't war, but all the countries in the world have resources and planning for war. Uh, but he felt that the biggest enemy facing uh, the world of mankind was, in fact, an epidemic. So he certainly had, uh, he called this, he called it right, and he talked about the, the lack of preparedness uh, that there seemed to be in, in the world. And I think this has brought it ho home to us, just, you know, that we're not really fully prepared for some. And we have to accept it is unprecedented. And we do have, there's an awful lot of shortfalls. I mean, we were sitting here this morning talking about your sector, which is extremely important because we're talking about people's lives here, vulnerable people. But yesterday, Bill Woolsey led 800 people off. They're all sitting this morning with the same worries and how am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to put food on the table? And I think that, you know, the government uh, in Westminster, I'm not here to, to be a, a defender of them, but I mean, I think that over the last few days, they have recognised some of the issues and they have done things that I didn't think they had the money to do, but all of a sudden there's, there's money to do these things. And I think we have to have, I suppose, a level of trust that, uh, and faith that they are going to, that they are going to come good. Uh, now, I mean, you've given us a list, or I've written it all down, all the things that you, that, that that you feel you need sorted out. Um, and I don't think there's a magic wand that's going to sort them all out overnight. I think we have to prioritise and say, you know, what's what's your biggest call? I think communication is vital. Um, you can't solve any of that unless people are sitting down and talking about it. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if the sector maybe shouldn't be calling for some sort of, and I don't like using this word, but war, a war committee, you know, that, uh, that, that will sit down and people will be in that room that will be empowered to give decisions rather than you having to write letters or go to 10 different committee meetings during the week or 10 different issues, you know, just a room, get everybody into a room that can sort out a lot of these uh, a lot of these problems. In terms of the the PPE, um, the you talk about you know people going around homes on a, you know maybe go to ten or fifteen different homes, maybe more. I don't know what their 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 two D their day load would be in it. But um, what sort of what sort of equipment would they wear going into somebody's home? The, the, nor the normal equipment would be basic infection control. It would be, um, you know, rubber gloves. Mm -hmm. um, they would have masks if there was an infection. 
and they would have training and guidance in, in normal infection control, likes of flu viruses and things like that. But they don't have the, the, the equipment and the training to actually do that for coronavirus. So, you know, the basic requirements. Yeah, all that, that equipment would have to be obviously mm -hmm. destroyed as they leave each house. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about volume here of, of personal protection. You know, and, it's and not even just give us some rubber gloves. Yeah, even the basic protection. Even the basic protection now that's getting hard to source because yeah. worldwide, um, you know, people have been using the basic protection in you know as a substitute for the the recommended. Yes. And the yeah. public are actually using masks now, um, you know, out on the street. So what 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 would you feel? I mean, that's a, a difficult question because I'm sure every every everything that you've told us this morning, I have about 20 things written down there that you absolutely need. Um, if I said to you and I this morning, we can help you deliver three of these today. You know, what what what, what do you feel is that? What's the pressing priority? I mean, things like early payments. We can sort that out early next week. You know, but what do we need sorted? PPE needs today. sorted today. And relaxation so, of regulations. And relaxation of regulations, yeah. The PPE, the PPE the if, if we can't provide the assurance to staff, the staff aren't going to be there. The staff are going to remain at home. Mm -hmm. And that's our biggest problem, to provide yeah. that reassurance to staff to say you are safe. And at the minute, they feel very vulnerable. Because they see the difference in the PPE equipment from handing from somebody in a care home yeah. or somebody in their own house to handing into the health system, you know, they're standing completely we've got different. To, we've got completely to different workers. Kit. We've got to ensure that people, you know, we're asking people to do a very difficult job. The least we can do is keep them as safe as possible in, in those situations, Alan. All the That's people that I know that work in, in your sector, I mean, they're not just employees, they're dedicated, they're really... They're absolutely angels. They love what they're doing, they are and they need to be special people. I, I couldn't personally do the work that they do. I admire the work that they do, and that they have the commitment to do it, the and compassion we do have, to do it. I mean, some of our employees obviously fall in within the category of being vulnerable themselves, yeah, yeah. in terms of asthmatic and you know various other... And they're worried about carrying it back to maybe, you know, their mother, father, yep. you know, so they have all of those issues as well. So they really are putting themselves in the front line and, in my view, not being properly protected or indeed not being protected to the same standard as others that's are. Their yeah, as their peers, and that's the Do you word. feel it would be useful if, if uh, I mean, it may be just pan in the sky and, and but just another talking shop, but do you feel that if you had a committee that had people that are empowered to actually make decisions for you? Would that be something well, that would be useful? Well, I, or? I understand they already have the gold command, silver command, and all of yeah. that issues within the health system. Yeah. I have been trying to say, look, we need to engage with the independent yeah. sector. We need to be there. And last week I had the agreement that yeah. they were going to engage with us around the staffing surge plans. Yeah. But when I went to a meeting earlier this week, I was told we're too busy. We've had to cancel those. I mean, some of the things you're talking about this morning, I've heard them mentioned about... Uh, uh, and you, you maybe have to read between the lines sometimes, but I thought, uh, uh, Sean Holland, isn't it? I, I thought he had a statement out last night, and he seemed to be hinting that volunteers could, you know, could could be brought in at short notice to help. Now, I know in my own community, there's a surge of people all want to volunteer, and, and, and uh, it's not terribly coordinated, but the wills are... And I think that's right, Alan. I think I think you know. But I think what Pauline said, Sean Holland is saying those things. We need clarity just around that Absolutely. communication. Yes, is it's it all talk at the moment. Yeah, a suggestion is, all is, is helpful. We need a decision, an implementation, and, and, what, yeah. and what we don't need is a group of people to tell us what to do. We need to actually be involved in that decision making because, with the greatest respect, we know our business best. And I think we need to have a, an, a, an opportunity to actually involve, to be involved in things and together to make decisions. This is something we've never experienced before, but we've got to find the answers. We may not have them, but we have a responsibility to find those answers. And I think there's huge willing across the whole of society to come together and come up with some answers. In all our organisations, we've had to set up critical incident management teams. We've got to make decisions, own those and take account, you know, be accountable for them. So, you know, it's not a time to criticise, and it's not a time to say you got it wrong. People are, by and large, doing the best they can do, but we just need an opportunity, and we're not actually getting involved. We're not being invited to be involved in those critical decisions or being advised of outcomes of questions. So I think that's really important. I think you go back, the very first thing you mentioned was, you, know, you need guidance, you need your questions answered, 
you need communication. Those are vital. And I think there, somebody's going to have to step up the plate and improve that. But I, I, I think if we could get a committee set up where you guys could just go in and say, look, this is what we need, and somebody's actually there and can say, well, I'll have to go back and talk to somebody, but if they can say, yes, we can deliver. The, we'll issue, the issue I see at the minute, Alan, is that there's a lot of people at, at ground level raising issues. The only voice they have are representatives like yes. us. They're coming up through. I'm putting them up through the system. They're getting swirled around yeah. the system. And, and, and you don't respect, know where Well, with respect, the, the people further yeah. up don't necessarily understand yeah. the practicalities, yeah. and then they're dri you know, dripping back down again, but then the communication's not happening out to the trusts. Yeah. So there's something about making the decision, making cut across, yeah. and actually get some sort of proper communication, because it's like Chinese whispers. Well, maybe if people in authority are listening to this this morning, or maybe wake a few people up. But it's also not a time for introducing bureaucratic systems. No. Yeah. And we've heard that across from, from the United Kingdom government in, talk, in terms of things like... You know, we need, there's additional funding for businesses, but let's not have an application form that's the size of war and peace. Let's actually make these simple, these processes simple, because again, we need to facilitate people to be able to, to, to draw down money and to draw down support and so on. So, so I think we have got to just do things differently. Okay. I think we've got to have the trust that that is going to be the case. I hope that will be the case. Okay, uh, we're just going to move over to the, the clerk. She has some questions from uh, Sinead. <clears throat> In fact, Sinead has forwarded a comment. Uh, comments. Uh, first of all, she just wanted to thank uh, Pauline and Agnes uh, for the presentation. She agrees that PPE equipment is a real priority for everyone at the front line and needs to be resolved today. And, and she agrees that the reality of this needs to be communicated clearly and uh, suggests any rules preventing stocking of basics such as paracetamol should be temporarily stepped down as immediate effect. Thank you. That's all I have from Sinead at the moment. Okay. Uh, I know, Colm, you had uh, you had a suggestion you wanted to make. Yeah, it's it's breaking up there a bit, but maybe Elish can put that. Yeah. So, Colm has proposed that the committee should write to the minister, outlining the range of concerns being expressed today from the sector, and asking for communication and action around these issues. Yes, please. Yeah, please. Yep. Thank I you. think that's in full really agreement with that, really Colin. Helpful. Thank you that's for that really contribution. Helpful. Listen, can I just say, um, we certainly, as a committee, take very. We really appreciate your time here today. We we understand how vital um, it, what the service that your guys are delivering. We absolutely understand that, and we completely recognise um, the contribution that they are making. Um, in a very, very difficult time, and we want to support you in any way we can. So I think it's safe to say that you have the, the full backing across uh, this whole assembly uh, in, in ensuring that, that you get what you need in order to do the amazing job that you continue to do. So thank you very much, and thank you for your time today. Thank you. I really Thanks appreciate very the invitation. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much, and thank you for your support. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, members. Um, so we're, we have an action there, really. You know, that, that proposed by column. So, yeah. and uh, I believe you've all endorsed that. So we'll, we'll action that through the clerk. Thank you. Um, did you. Excuse me, Chair. Did you get? I was taking a lot of notes. So even if we just sort of supplied our notes, so we don't miss any points. You know, in terms of making sure the information is complete as soon as possible. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we do have Hansard as well here, so but that's okay. very useful. And that's good. I think that everybody's. A delay in that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Um, it's good to have everybody working on the same, the same page, the same aims. Okay. Um, so, obviously, it's a it's a shame we don't have the department here today to answer any of these issues, but. Uh, I'm sure members would agree that we'd, we'd want to invite the department to brief the committee on the issues raised today in relation to the care sector. I have agreement. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. That's grand. Okay. Uh, do you want a comfort break? Yeah. Uh, do members want to take a, a very short comfort break? Of back here at what time? Say, twenty-two. Sure. All right. Thank you. We'll take a quick comfort break. Assembly, committee room twenty-nine. Okay, members. So we now have a. A second briefing from Community Pharmacy MI on the impact of COVID-19 and other uh, key sector representatives of Community Pharmacy MI are here to brief the committee on issues affecting the supply of medication 
and provision of personal protective equipment. And members, you will have in front of you on the table a short briefing which has been provided. So can I just welcome Jared Green, Chief Executive of Community Pharmacy NI, and also Peter Rice, Community Pharmacist from Mackenzie Rice Pharmacy. And we really appreciate um, you being able to come at very short notice to brief us at the committee today. We know how important this issue is, and I'm not going to waste your time and invite you to just uh, brief us, um, and then we can move on to a series of questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Chair and, and Vice Chair of the Committee, for the opportunity to brief you here today. We are in unprecedented times, and it is, it, it, we really appreciate being given, you the, being given the opportunity to update you on the issues in community pharmacy and how we are responding to the, the crisis that is, is developing. If I can start by just giving an overview of, of community pharmacy and, and, and where we are in, in, in the COVID response. Community pharmacists play a frontline role in dispensing medicines to the public and giving advice on how to manage those medicines. There are, over, there are just over 530 community pharmacies in Northern Ireland who collectively deal with around 123,000 people per day. In relation to COVID-19, since the COVID-19 pandemic was announced, community pharmacists have seen a huge surge in the numbers of people coming through their doors in the order of several thousand per day, and that's right across the network. Pharmacists and their teams of staff have been literally working around the clock to manage the numbers, to manage the prescriptions, to replenish stock, see patients and give advice over this last two weeks. Due to this surge in demand, the network is now implementing a range of special measures to try and ensure that the core service is maintained now and over the next few months to deal with the threat of COVID and ensure that the public continue to get their medicines when they need them. With the Department of Health, the Public Health Agency, the Health and Social Care Board and other primary care partners, community pharmacy will play a key role in the health service that has to reduce to core services over the coming months. This is to ensure that the vulnerable, the elderly and those with chronic conditions are prioritised and medicine supplies to those patient groups and all public in Northern Ireland are maintained. People will have seen over the recent few days the new measures that many pharmacies are implementing, which include up to, 20, up to 48 hours turnaround time request for prescriptions to be ready once they're received into the pharmacy, new screening and exclusion zones within pharmacies, for example, counter style um, partitioning to reduce the likelihood of spreading coronavirus. This is critical because if pharmacy teams go down, then the pharmacy will have no option but to close. Restricted access into pharmacies, for example, with policies of allowing only three people in at a time, or indeed people waiting uh, at an exclusion zone at the front door. And many pharmacies are starting to take a one hour break from the dispensing duties during the middle of the day to allow the staff to recoup and recover from the pressures, to clean and disinfect the, the pharmacy and to replenish stock, and that's all in the interests of the public that we're serving on a daily basis. As you know, over this last couple of days, we have invited the public and we are appealing to the public not to visit a pharmacy if they have COVID-19 symptoms. This is to safeguard the health of the pharmacy team and also the, the customers and patients that come into those pharmacies because the patients that come into the pharmacies are in, naturally in the at-risk groups by virtue of needing the health care that we provide. We're asking the public not to stockpile medicines. We, are, we have been told that there will be enough for everyone if there is a responsible approach to ordering prescriptions, but it is being challenged at the minute. It is being, um, there are some difficulties starting to appear. And we ask the public, and I think they are starting to, to listen, we're asking the public to be patient with the staff and the teams. They are doing their best. The pressures facing community pharmacy teams are immense, as I have said, at this time. And this is recognised by the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer and the Health Minister. Pharmacy teams can cope with the workload. The patients just need to be patient which the majority are, and we thank the public for their understanding so far. The challenge faced by community pharmacy in relation to COVID-19 has already started 
and it will continue. Community pharmacy teams have been facing the challenge over this last two weeks. If you look at Italy, it is the pharmacies that are staying open. They are the only accessible healthcare provider still going when everywhere else is closed. It is vital that those vital, the community pharmacy services here are protected, they're resourced so that we can continue to play our role going forward. This is a situation that is going to roll for a period of at least 10 to 16 weeks and beyond. Right now, our pharmacy teams need immediate support from the health service and the politicians here in the assembly. We have solutions and some immediate asks, but speed, as one of the recent leading WHO public health uh, doctors said recently, is of the essence. Community pharmacy cannot wait any longer. People are trying to cope with an evolving situation here. Some of the solutions that I think community pharmacy can offer and solutions that are needed. Teams of the staff in the pharmacies want to be in their pharmacies. That's what we do. We look after our public. We need immediate access to COVID-19 testing for staff so that staff with symptoms that resemble COVID-19 but who don't actually have a positive diagnosis can be diagnosed and return to work. This is crucial. We are assessing the level of uh, self-isolation in team members and as of this morning there are 70 staff there are 90 staff across a number of pharmacies not the full network who are self-isolating 20 pharmacists and 70 support staff it is critical for our teams that we have access to COVID-19 testing so that if staff are presenting with some symptoms we can determine if they need to isolate or whether they can come back and contribute to the team working because without the staff at the minute who have been brilliant, the service in ph many pharmacies will simply not be sustainable. Secondly, we need GPs to work with local pharmacies to reduce the blockages that are currently in the system to pharmacies getting the prescriptions from surgeries and from also contacting surgery staff. We're working with the GP leadership bodies. They recognise the difficulties but we need local practices to work with the local pharmacies to, in the interest of the patients and ensuring that the patients can get their medicines in as timely a manner as they can. Pharmacies also need assistance in terms of the financial aspects. We need certainty immediately that we can continue to pay wholesalers and that we can continue to get the medicines from the wholesalers. At present, with the surge in the number of prescriptions and the surge in the volumes of prescriptions, the purchasing that is currently being done through pharmacies has rocketed, and that is putting a strain on the financial operation of the pharmacies. We need protection for the pharmacy remuneration and, and monthly payments. Community pharmacies are also, in addition to that, having to commit significant additional resource to their practices, whether that's premises adaptation, and many of you will have seen over recent days, the, the screens, etc., that pharmacies have had to put in. They're not getting any support at this stage to do those measures. Staff are coming in and making themselves available. We're, in, we're seeing pharmacy teams having to take additional staff members and try to get additional staff members to come in, and staff are working overtime here. They're, they're not staff and pharmacy owners are not asking at the minute how they're going to be sorted out. They're just throwing themselves into the challenge of looking after the public. This at the minute is out of their, their own pockets. We need an immediate COVID emergency response payment to deal with those costs. We are dealing with the legacy of a 10-year underinvestment of some £20 million per annum in community pharmacy. But at this minute, community pharmacy and the teams in those pharmacies are stepping up to this COVID challenge. The public can see that, but it is not sustainable without the support from government and the health service. An immediate and significant injection of funding is required now. It's not negotiable. It's required now so that we can cover the additional costs that the public and US politicians can see the pharmacies committing at this moment in time so that we can keep going and provide the services that we do to patients. Looking ahead, I think the whole management of repeat prescriptions must transfer to community pharmacy. It happens in other countries, whether it's Scotland or in the Republic of Ireland. Community pharmacy teams know their patients. 
We have a relationship with those patients across often several generations of families and the skill set is there. We have a situation at the minute where the prescriptions are in another facility which we know that the patient needs but nobody can access. We need community pharmacy to take ownership of that important role. That would work for the patient, that would work for the health centre and it would free up or the health service and it would free up uh, time in GP surgeries. It, it is a simple solution and it can happen relatively quickly and it needs to be prioritised. As I said, community pharmacy is stepping up. This situation will evolve and there are challenges still to come. But the executive has to support us right now. And that is prioritising access to COVID-19 testing for staff and immediate certainty with additional funding. Before I finish for questions, I want to pay tribute to all the staff and all the pharmacy teams right across Northern Ireland. They have stepped up. They are coming in to work early in the morning. They are working through the day and they are working late into the night, often into the mornings. They are coming in at the weekend and on St Patrick's Day, most pharmacies that were closed actually had the full quota of their staff in behind dealing with the backlog of work. Pharmacy can do, is, is stepping up to the challenge. It is the teams have been exemplary. As a profession, we are doing our bit. It's up to the department and the executive to immediately step in, prioritise the asks that we have so that our teams can continue to look after our patients throughout this COVID-19 crisis and more critically beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jared. And uh, I have to say it's very, it's very humbling to hear the work that's going on uh, in the background and the, the care that, that um, your profession has for, for everybody else. It's, uh, it's really um, very humbling to hear that and to hear that the efforts are going on to protect others. So thank you for that. Um, a couple of questions to you. Um, it's becoming very apparent that testing is vitally essential and um, you might not be aware, I mentioned a couple of times in this meeting already that I've spoken to the Minister um, this morning and that he's assured me that there, there, there are real efforts being made to ramp up the testing and I think it's, it's vital that, that healthcare workers and people on the front line must receive that testing where necessary because that's, that's quite... Um, Scary. 90, 90 yeah, that's, people already that's not the outside full the network. That's yes. the people that have reported back to us. And the, the, the issue is, if they have COVID-19, then understandably yeah. they have to self-isolate. Yeah. But if they don't at present, they are, still have to self-isolate, but they could be back in the pharmacy. Yeah. And it's just so critical at the minute with the workload that pharmacy teams have access to as the full complement of staff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I suppose we can, well, we're not scientists, and I suppose we can assume that Actually, at this, we're at a relatively early stage of this crisis, that a lot of those people could come back yeah, into yeah. the workforce, so we, we need them back in there. Um, the other thing is, in terms of um, drug supplies and uh, paracetamol in particular, you'd mentioned um, when I'd spoken to you um, yesterday that, uh, that there was an issue around paracetamol in particular. Yeah. Did you want to go into any detail on that? Yeah. Um Paracetamol, um, I mean, people will, will know it's, it's one of the most commonly used medicines and available to, to buy over the counter. Traditionally, maybe up until last week, you could have purchased a pack of it for 79p or whatever it was in, in a local pharmacy. This week, the prices that pharmacies are being charged uh, through the supply chain for the same pack is approaching £2. So it is not just sustainable for us to sell it at 79p. We will always work in the interest of the patient, but that's part of the reason why the price has gone up. There are global issues at play because the supply of some of the core ingredients uh, for paracetamol uh, in India has, 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 has come into problems, and that has affected the ability of paracetamol to be made globally, and therefore you know, there's, there is a, a supply issue there. But pharmacy, it's not only the over-the-counter medicines, as we call it, it's also the prescription medicines. We're seeing some medicines prices rocketing. We have to buy the medicines in at the price that we are charged. Otherwise, the patients don't get those medicines. This is where pharmacy needs the certainty around the funding and the injection to support us. We can't carry all of this uncertainty. We can't carry the additional costs at this moment in time when we have an underlying funding issue. 
and therefore we're, we're, we're asking and we have been in discussion with the department officials around the immediacy of funding being released. We just want to get on with the job of looking after patients. That's what we do day in, day out. Pharmacy teams don't want to have to worry about whether their business is viable. And with the increase in the cost of medicines and with the frequency of much larger purchasing, many pharmacies are starting to hit thresholds whereby uh, wholesalers are starting to demand payment in advance uh, or on account straight away so that medicines can continue to be provided. There is a lot of uncertainty within the network. We need the investment to stabilise our network so that we can get on with looking after patients and not worrying about the prices. Peter um, is a um, community <coughs> pharmacist and Peter will be able to tell you about the, the issues on the ground and I'm happy for Peter to, to supplement and, and, and lead on any aspects around the day-to-day -day issues. Okay, and um, before Peter you come in, um, just to ask, you know, are there, is there any legitimate reason for the prices of these medications to be rocketing, uh, in, in your opinion? I think where there are global, sorry Peter, maybe. Yeah, there's a number of factors at play. Um, a lot of these medicines come out with this country, so there's the raw ingredient issues with paracetamol. There's actually an issue of the, the foil being available to seal the packs, which... Okay. If we can't get the foil, the manufacturers can't make it. And if they can't make it, they can't supply it. Um, we're dealing with market forces with immediately a global spike in requests for certain medicines. If there's a, an insufficiency in supply, the market price goes up. So it, it is out with pharmacies control. I think this is where the, the public have a responsibility, is that th there is a certain amount in the supply chain and if the demand is such that that is swamped, swallowed up straight away, that's what causes a supply problem. So we're, we need the public just to pace their you know, use and, and request for prescriptions. Okay, um, thank you for that. I mean, uh, I just, uh, I mean, I know personally about you can't get paracetamol in, in shops now. That's something that so commonly you couldn't get you can't get it now and, and obviously there there must be people who are stockpiling it at home and obviously you would discourage that as we all would uh, to ensure that there's enough to go around um, in terms of the social distancing and you've you've uh, you've mentioned that quite a bit in your presentation there and that's uh, quite obvious is there is there much of a cost incurred by what you're already doing creating those physical barriers is there much of a cost incurred to pharmacy to uh, introduce these measures? The, the whole cost of it is borne by pharmacy. It is an individual business decision and it has come at, <coughs> at a few thousand pounds for each of my branches to put it in place. I felt we had very little choice um, and in many cases despite the, the recommendations coming out, people are presenting at the pharmacy with coughs with high temperatures um, for triage, and we can't risk our team being wiped out. And I suppose we should emphasise too that that, that is not the guideline, as if you have uh, a persistent cough or, or a temperature, you're if you not. If flu light symptoms, do not present at the Don't pharmacy. present, and I think it's good that we actually clarified that today again, that you don't present to any. Uh, GP or uh, emergency service or indeed the pharmacist with those um, symptoms. Okay, I'm just going to move on to uh, Colin. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would just like to tell the president that I the absolutely I also think that worry that there would be or crisis. Key medicines should be across the world as well as and the governments need to do whatever to ensure that these medicines are available. Um, I have a couple of questions there to keep people back here, but I Yeah, I can read the questions for you, Colin, yeah. Um, first is how could community pharmacy solve some of the issues that have arisen this week? when GPs introduced the changes to prescription ordering arrangements. The second question, how long do you think it would take to implement the measures of community pharmacies taking control of the repeat prescriptions as proposed by Jared? Um, 
A lot of our issues is access to the surgeries, communication lines. It, these are problems in the systems that have existed for years and are now being highlighted. We feel that we are very well placed to manage a repeat prescription service. Indeed, many pharmacy, pharmacists already in GP surgeries manage this. Yeah. What we need is the enablers and to let us just do that. We feel that it would take the pressure off the surgeries and would quell a lot of the panic from patients trying to get through the surgeries, clogging up much needed phone lines and allowing us to deal with the day-to-day -day repeats. I'll ask Jared for yeah. how long it would take to implement. We, we are looking with the, the board and the department at introducing potentially a, a, a relatively quick um, version of, of a supply or a dispensing, repeat dispensing type service. Um, but this is, I think this sort of highlights, as Peter says, there's a system error here, there's a system fault. And I think, you know, when we look at, at arrangements in Scotland, we look at arrangements in the Republic of Ireland, they have systems in place there that allows the pharmacy to be authorised to dispense repeat medicines on a monthly basis, <coughs> excuse me, for up to maybe six months or a year. That takes the pressure off the GP s services. They don't need to be dealing with that aspect of it. <coughs> the community pharmacy then can deal with the patient on a monthly basis. That interaction with the patient happens. It's about. It's not just about the supply. It's about the additional advice. It's the monitoring. It's the health and well-being. It's about the signposting if, if symptoms come up. That can be done in the community pharmacy. Community pharmacies are, are health hubs in local communities. They're where people go. We don't need... Uh, of, of the prescriptions that are dispensed, something like 60% are for long-term conditions, repeat medicines and so forth. There's a huge volume of work that goes through the GP surgery that doesn't need to be there. It can be handled in community pharmacy. We know our patients, we, and our patients, more importantly, know us. And this is not rocket science. This, there's elements of investment that, that are required. IT may, 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 is, is certainly required. But this is something that can be fast-tracked through uh, an initial um, like COVID emergency supply type service and it takes the pressure off because patients can't get into GP surgeries. Pharmacies are asked to go to the GP surgeries to pick up the prescriptions but understandably because of GP concerns they have closed their, their facilities but that makes it hard for community pharmacy. That stage isn't needed. It, yeah. it, it should be held in the community pharmacy and the linkage is electronically with the GPs around that. But it can be done in community pharmacy, and that makes life easier for the patients. They can come into the pharmacy as and when they need their medicines within a, a lot of times. That helps the community pharmacy teams plan the, the work associated with the dispensing of those medicines, because at the minute we've got a surge and everybody's looking at it all at the one time. And that all, I mean, everybody talks about flattening the curve, this, is, this, this, this aspect here can be flattened relatively quickly and I think it needs to be prioritised. But what we need to do here, first of all, is stabilise community pharmacy and this is where the financial uncertainty needs to be addressed urgently, as well as the <coughs> staffing issue around COVID-19 status. Those are my asks of the committee today and of the executive. Can I just add on that? Go ahead. I actually operate a pharmacy in Dublin. We are not seeing the same run on the pharmacy in the south as we are in the north because they have this ability to manage supply without having to access the health centres. Okay, that's that's good to know. And obviously, I mean, it's easy to forget actually that there's so many other health issues and conditions out there apart from COVID-19. Yeah. Um, and really, if people are not getting the appropriate medications and if they're not using them appropriately, that also leads to hospital admissions, which is needless. Um, so it seems to be a very, very good um, plan to to enable pharmacists to do that repeat dispensing. So um, it's it's good to hear that today. Are there any other questions there from Colm? Colm, have you any other questions you want to put at this no, stage? No, I'm okay at the moment. Okay, thank you, Alan. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I understood in the past, and maybe this is not correct or not, but it, it's, it would be a very important bit of information, but I, I was told in the past that if there's not a pharmacist available on the premises, you got to shut. Is that still the case? Does there, by law, do you have to have a qualified pharmacist on site? Yes. While your door is open? 
there must be a pharmacist, a responsible pharmacist, on the premises, or the shutter can't open. Right, okay. That's why the urgency in getting testing, okay. because of well, pharmacists. Just, just on the testing, I'm only being the devil's advocate here, and I, uh, I support all that you've, you've said this morning, but in terms of testing, if I'm a pharmacist or an important support member of staff, and, and I have reason to believe that I should self-isolate and I'm taking the responsible action and I'm staying at home uh, and I've got symptoms. <clears throat> Does it really matter whether I know whether it's COVID-19 or whether I've just got a bad flu? Because if I do get tested and some mechanism is, is created that I can go and get tested or the test can be brought to me and somebody says, no, I haven't got COVID-19, you wouldn't be wanting that person with a bad flu or even a bad cold, they go back into work because it's just as bad that other workers would get pick up a flu or pick up a bad cold. You know, so if you're self isolating at home, as I say, I, 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 what is what what is the rationale behind really needing to know? Because there's no treatment, there's no specialised treatment. So what really, why why do you need to know that you've got COVID nineteen? Other than if it was me, I'd like to know. <laughs> I'm sure you would as well, but. It, it, it's not, I, I can't see how it's going to allow people to, to immediately come back to work. There's an, a number of aspects to that. First of all, people are self-isolating whether or not they have symptoms. If one family member is showing symptoms, the whole family self-isolates. So that is a big problem. The second thing is if people, for one reason or another, want to come back and they have mild symptoms, and they are capable of working, we need to be assuring the rest of our team that they are fit to come back to work. And as you've said, there is already a shortage of pharmacies, pharmacists in community. If we can't get those who have mild symptoms, whether that be a cold or a flu or other, back to work, those pharmacies close. Right. Uh, now, in terms of the, the, the surge in, in prescription medicines, and you're talking now about a 48 hour turnaround and we've all been used for just getting into the canvas and sitting in the, the, the seat for five minutes and we get a prescription. It's a great service. Um, why do you, given that this that there, there are no medicines really to prescribe for this this for flu or, or, or colds or COVID, um, why do you think there is this surge in, in, in prescription medicines getting issued and is it just seasonal or, or in terms of, I mean, to the GP, I mean, my GP, if I started to order repeat prescriptions every two weeks when he's given me a month's supply, he would very quickly ask me a question, uh, why you, you know, why are you asking for these? You know, we've given you a month's supply and, and you, you only got out a fortnight ago. So do the GPs not have a responsibility to, to maybe control if, if there is? I don't know whether stockpiling of, of prescription medicines is, is part of the problem. It might, it might be. Do the GPs have a responsibility to try and curtail that a little bit and, and stop the, the surge on you of prescriptions getting presented? Um, and the other thing was that I wanted to talk about was the, you've talked about the economic impact and nobody likes to talk about money, you know, you're providing a service, but the reality is if you guys are not making money and not making profit, you can't pay the wages, you can't pay your rates, you can't pay your rent, you're out of business. You are a business, and I think we'll have to appreciate that that's, that you are a business, and you do need, you know, you need that income. At the moment, you're, you're taking action, uh, and it's sensible that you're only allowing a couple of people into your premises. That must be, have a, must be having a pretty devastating effect on your turnover of ancillary products. Like, I mean, petrol stations, could not exist if they just sold petrol. So they sell groceries now and coffee and food. Um, and pharmacies sell all sorts of, I mean, there's even grocery items that you sell, kitchen rolls, toilet rolls, if you can get them, um, and, and also beauty products and all the rest. Of it. And that must be absolutely vital for your, you know, for your balance sheet. You know, you have to get those sales. So you're going to, you must be suffering a downturn in, in, in that at the moment. And prescriptions, just doing prescriptions, it's not going to, I assume, from what I hear over the years, it's not going to keep your door open. You do need those ancillary products. So would it be reasonable to say that the government will have to, and I think you maybe alluded to it, that the government will have to give you some sort of package 
to, to make up that shortfall of, of, of profit that, that you would normally get from the ancillary products that you're not going to get at the minute because anybody walks into your place now and they're queuing outside and they're one of three that gets in, they're not going to be strolling around the, the beauty section. They're in to get whatever it is they want and they'll be straight out again, you know. So the, the, I take it that would be a rationale for, for, for some financial help. Okay. Um, there's the first one that you asked was the surge. Why the surge? There's a number of reasons for it. Um, one is obviously people that would have underlying respiratory conditions that maybe wouldn't need their inhalers on an ongoing basis, but are making sure that they have an inhaler, which may previously not have been it or that they, they feel they need. The other problem is we're seeing an increase in quantity of medicines. So the GPs would have to take contingency in case in a month's time, they're not able to open their doors. So there's a rationale in them trying to manage that. And what we are seeing on the other side, as well as that with um, people going out to supermarkets and so on, people are worried that they won't get out. And that's why there's a surge, because there's a certain amount of people are going out, reasonably so, right on their 28 days, whereas previously might, might have let it lapse to 30. 35 days. So we're seeing people coming out more often to get. People are coming out to stockpile. And in a lot of cases, it's prudent because you may not be open in a month's time to serve that. That's the surge. Um, in terms of the retail, absolutely, our, our retail has nosedived. But as professionals, we believe that the health of the public really comes first. And we have stepped up and taken that business hit because we in this crisis field, that the best thing we can do is support the public health, try and take the pressure off, and unfortunately that has come at a cost to our business, so we would welcome any support that the government yeah, would give. It certainly can't depend on your goodwill, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it, it, especially it given the, the last 10 years of insufficiency yeah. in it, where we really have been running hand to mouth, we do need that address now. Yeah. I think what we're seeing in the surge is certainly people coming in and looking for the, the simple medicines that they can buy over the counter, the paracetamol and so forth, but the huge surge is down to people wanting more, uh, you know, another supply of their repeat prescriptions. The GPs don't know when they're going to be open again, so they're facilitating the provision of the prescriptions. So we're seeing that surge coming through. It is repeat prescriptions. This is not about profit. This is about just running costs. Pharmacies generally, 90% of their activity will be NHS related. 90% of their turnover, call it what you want, will be NHS. Ten, the, the retail is very, very small proportion. And when you look at the range of products in pharmacies, there is such com competition with other outlets are for those pro products. It's, it's really just there as, as a space filler in, in many instances. It is the NHS element, as Peter says, this is about a profession that has patient care at its heart. We're managing a drugs bill of 400 million pound every year. That's £400 million worth of risk that the pharmacists are taking on annually. They're managing the stock, they're managing staff, they're managing the investment requirements, etc., etc. As Peter says, this is in the backdrop of a £20 million per annum deficit. People at this moment in time can't pay their wholesalers for their medicines. So profit is not where we're at at the minute. This is basic running costs, and this is why the injection of funding around the additional staffing costs, the additional measures is required, but it's also why there is certainty and a, and a support for the drug costs that we are going to be incurring. And there's two elements to that. What about in ter long term, and just, uh, just one more question, Chair. Uh, my doctor will only give me a month's supply of whatever I want normally. And I think that would be across the board. So you're saying that doctors and I are taking a long term view and giving people maybe three months supply. Now, if that's the case, is, is that going to have a knock-on effect uh, for pharmacists? Because I don't know what way you're paid, but if, if you're paid per prescription that you assemble, if you're preparing a prescription for somebody with three months supply and they're not going to come back to you for three months, you know, you're going to miss out on another two prescriptions that you would have been possibly getting paid a fee for. So. In the long term, is that going to have an effect on you? Yes, absolutely. There's two 
portions to our payment, the fee element for yes. the actual processing of the prescription, yes. that will be lost for the next two months. Yes. Um, that is a big, big impact on us. Um, just on previous question that you asked, that in terms of the percentage of retail, our turnover might be split 90-10, but retail has been shoring up a lot of our business. So even though the turnover on the prescriptions is a large part of the business, in terms of the profitability, the retail is shoring it up. And as we now start to lose these fee elements for the professional work that goes on, whether it's one prescription or two prescriptions or so on, when we're losing that, it's costing us, not today, but in the next two, three months, and that will cause a real problem. Are GPs routinely given more supply at the moment rather than the month? Yes, we're, we're seeing a move from sometimes 28 days to 84 days, um, 56 days. It is ramping up. Yeah. Okay. I think the issue as well for the health service is that there is a greater risk of medicines wastage once you start increasing yeah. the number of med uh, prescriptions and months that you give patients. And this is why it needs to be managed carefully. And I think community pharmacy is ideally placed to do that. Um, and, you know, we all have a responsibility. We're healthcare professionals. Yes, we have businesses and pharmacy operations to make sure that they're viable. At this moment in time, the, the, the profession is really struggling. The profession is, is, is on its knees when it's actually trying to step up most. And at this time, we absolutely need the support of the Assembly and the support of the Health Service here. There are long-running issues here with our funding. You, you can look at fees, you know, maybe not being paid for a month or two, but the totality of the investment in pharmacy is wrong at the minute, it has been. That's a long-running issue, and I, I think we, were due to, we are due to speak to the committee next week around that. We need to sort out the, 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 the underlying issues, but right here and now, because of the step up that the community pharmacy is doing for the health service and for the public here, that's cut, incurring extra cost. And it's occurring a lot of uncertainty as to pharmacists being able to honour their obligations with their wholesalers around the medicines. There's also issues around our prescriptions being processed by the health service, and there's concerns that you know that's 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 a process that involves humans as well, and that's why we need the certainty certainty that our payments will be maintained here going forward, as well as the additional resource that's needed. This is about continuing to try and provide the service. It's not, at this time, about profits. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jerry? Thanks. And thanks again, uh, Jerry, for the presentation. And obviously, uh, community pharmacists are doing an important job now. You know, uh, with, this, with this sort of situation, we, we want to thank them for it, for their um, role and uh, what they're doing. Um, just a couple of quick points. Um, I think, obviously, the testing is very essential. You know, um, I said before, you came in here in a previous presentation, there's people I know who are working in the health service who have to self-isolate. They may or may not have COVID-19, and their partners who are working in the health service are having to self-isolate it because they're obviously their, their partner is, is um, showing potential symptoms. But those are people who could be back in our health service, and I'm sure it's probably a similar situation with community pharmacists who are showing symptoms but have to isolate because they're following medical advice. Um, but because there isn't enough testing ongoing, they have to remain at home for at least, what, two weeks. So that's why I concerning and, and the testing needs to happen as a matter of urgency. Um, so I would kind of echo your, your, your points on that. Thank you. Um, in terms of, and I know you kind of highlighted, Jared, the, the problems with GPs in terms of the pressure that they're under. Um, and I've got a few messages even the last few days online, people asking me what they should do. They're trying to ring through their GP to get uh, prescriptions. Um, so if you could give some practical advice to people, <coughs> excuse me, like that, who, um, if you're trying to get prescriptions, but GPs are overwhelmed. What, what should they do? Um, just some general advice, please. Uh, and just finally, I think the um, suppliers bumping up prices at this time to me is scandalous and repugnant. You know, people. Um, I'm not talking about yourselves, obviously, um, but you know, people should not be making massive profits in this situation. This is a public health epidemic. It's an emergency, and we should be all coming together. And the fact that people are trying to profit here off the back of this. Um, is, is quite concerning and for me I think we need to have a, a focus and a conversation about not acting in the interest of modern forces and saying what's in the interest of public health and good public health uh, and there's a lot of um, stuff that can be done around that but yeah I think that's, that's quite quite horrendous to be frank. Jerry asked about responsible contact but the problem is that a lot of people are quite rightly trying to contact the GPs for advice now because they can't present. Um, 
as a result of that, they can't order the repeat prescriptions. I have a case yesterday where a patient needed an urgent cancer medicine. They had tried to contact their GP for four days in a row, weren't able to get through and presented and said, I am now out of my medication, can you supply? And we don't have the facility to do that. We, we're in an emergency supply situation. There are issues, obviously, we've got then around controlled substances. We're, we're looking at those. Patients need quite urgent pain medicines, and we, we're in a similar position. And also, some of the most vulnerable that require compliant support, where we would be trying to keep ahead of prescription so that we have time to prepare that compliant support package to get out. I have a number of contractors that contacted me and said, will we just dispense the compliant support because the patient needs it and try and resolve the prescription issues later? Because the actual physical barrier is closed and you can't leave in paper requests, the phone lines have become clogged and that is causing us issues. It's also causing us issues with clinical queries. If we're concerned about a patient or concerned about a prescribing matter and we wish to contact the surgeries, that is now not an avenue available to us and that obviously will have impact. I think, you know, as I said in, in, in my um, statement, we've been linking in with the GP leadership, the, 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 the bodies in Northern Ireland, and they do recognise that the impact that this has had on community pharmacy being able to access the, the GP surgery for either those prescriptions, for those clinical cl queries, as Peter said, uh, and for follow-up in, in any regard, they recognise that there needs to be a relaxation to, co to allow community pharmacy not to be overburdened at this time. We, we, we need, and I, I, I understand there has been communication to practices around that, but we really do need to see on the ground this being fast-tracked so that th there is that open, that, you know, the facilitation of the community pharmacy contact as well as the patient contact. We're dealing with a very difficult situation. It's evolving all the time, but I, I think it, it calls for, for, for leadership on, on so many different fronts. Pharmacy is stepping up here and it's looking now to the health service, it's looking to the, the, the general practitioners and it's looking to the politicians to recognise that, we're, that we, 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 we are coping. We want to continue and we want to play our part, but we just need some certainty in relation to the easement and getting the, the patient's needs from, in, from the GP surgery in terms of the, the, the finances to ensure that we can continue to honour uh, wholesaler and, and obligations and then that we have the additionality um, for the additional costs that we're, we're incurring. And, and it, is, it is about all of those elements and I think it is the teams, the pharmacy teams are stepping up and I think it has to be a broad approach here to get the solution. See, just Peter, just on, on the clogging up the system, because that's very concerning, because obviously if somebody, um, the, the advice, as I understand it, is if somebody is self-isolated for a week, um, if they live here, they have to ring their GP um, to see if they um, qualify for a test, is my understanding. If the GP service is clogged up because of people ringing in, because of people trying to get uh, repeat uh, prescriptions, we face a situation where potentially those people may come down to the pharmacy or they may go back in the work, and so it's a very, very worrying situation. So is there anything that you think the department could do concretely to try and alleviate those particular pressures? But really what we're looking for is a step change. Allow us to manage the 60% which would be clinically appropriately managed in the pharmacy. If you can do that, it takes the pressure off that repeat prescribing, which does free up the GP surgeries. In response to your people presenting in the pharmacy, just yesterday one of my pharmacists informed me that a patient came in who had been tested positive <laughs> and said, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. So the message isn't getting out quickly enough. Mm. If we can resolve the repeat prescribing and deal with that urgently, then those phone lines can be opened up and people will, in the first instance, ask someone for advice before they turn up face to face for advice. We, we are involved in various escalation planning with the board and the department, and we are looking at a range of measures that pharmacy can step into. The situation is going to evolve and, and, and maybe develop in, in, in more complicated ways, but we need the basic problems sorted out on the ground here. We, and the, you know, and my asks here are clear: sort out 
the immediacy of the current problems that we have, so that then we are equipped and able to step up when the escalation <coughs> planning has to, has to kick in. At the minute, there's just um, you know there's uns there's a lot of uncertainty, and um, we, we we really are looking to the health service, to the minister, and uh, the executive really to recognise that community pharmacy is in the middle of this crisis, and we we need the support and we need it quickly. We, we I cannot stress this is not about the end of next month. This is this week. We need to be uh, being told, and our members need to be being told. Um, so that they can just get on with providing the service without the worry of is everything going to be all right? Okay, thank you, um, Paula. Thank you, um, thank you, Jared, and thank you for your leadership at this time. I know it's uh, called a pharmacy on Saturday, and seen it firsthand the pressure you're under, but specifically committee pharmacy, and I think doing a brilliant job at the minute. Um, and also in the context that you had just had your ballot on industrial action, so you know, your pressures are there before this even started. And I think it's great that you're going to be able to come back next week and talk in wider detail. But just for today, um, you mentioned there are the 20 pharmacists who are self-isolating. Is there any conversation with the GPs around the practice-based pharmacists being redeployed? I think yes, that is all part and parcel of the escalation planning, okay. and I think there's also, you know, um, I think there'll be communication <coughs> with the chief pharmaceutical officer today around uh, people that maybe are on the pharmacy register coming forward, Good. and this is all part and parcel of the escalation planning. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the quantifying um, the additional hours, the renovation costs, you know, are, is that what community pharmacists are, are doing at the minute, or I suppose you're firefighting? I, I think we're firefighting at the minute. Okay. It is just about the here and now, but those costs will be easily captured. It's not hard to to quantify the the capital expenditure that will be okay. associated. It won't be hard to the additional the wage costs that are there okay. but I mean I've been contacted by pharmacy owners who are complete admiration of their staff for rallying around and just coming in early working through the evening into the into the early morning coming in on holidays mm -hmm. and um, you know we are just looking now to the to the center to say you know support us here because mm -hmm. this is what we're doing this is what we want to do but you really need to step in, and you know the underfunding that has been there, the 20 million pound. We need a significant portion of that there as a an emergency um, investment here, okay. just to, to stabilise. Can I follow I, I, up? I'm sorry. sorry. Um, just in terms of the extra costs, it's one thing the extra costs now, the increase in the minimum wage and the knock-on effect that that's going to have on the first okay. of April yes. and the pensions was already going to cause quite a significant concern. Mm -hmm. We're looking at probably a 6% increase in our wage bills with a minimal increase in our core funding. And that was enough already to cause concern that pharmacies' lights would go out. With the extra wage bill, we really need some support now, or it won't be a question of if we were close, it'll be a question of when. Thank you. Um, just lastly, Chair. Um, the, the, the last two presentations there were focusing on um, social care and um, nursing homes. What, what sort of, how, how is that working out at the minute in terms of the blister packs and in terms of delivery? Is that causing even more frustration and chaos for you in terms of making sure that those medicines are getting through to the most vulnerable? Absolutely. Blister packs are one of the most labour intensive yeah. ways of managing our dispense, and these are the most vulnerable patients. Nursing homes obviously require a lead time in terms of accessing the prescription, preparing it and getting it ready. As I was saying, we're not getting the scripts in a timely fashion. We don't have the people to process that extra workload, which is currently not commissioned and was done by a pharmacy in support of social care. Those are the things that could potentially be lost first. And the ongoing burden then for social care, who can't facilitate without it, is a real concern for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paula. And I'm just in the back of Paula's point there. Um, are there are there individuals out there who could be um, upskilled um, or uh, by relaxation of regulations that could be empowered actually to help the pharmacists in dealing with that? I'm thinking in particular of you know the filling of the blister packs and obviously it's vitally important that the medication is right and it has to be overseen and all that. But are there people out there that could uh, could help? Um, deal with this, and would that be would that be recommended? I think you know, setting aside the current crisis, I think skill mix within pharmacies is something that we are looking at. 
you know, there is a shortage of pharmacists in Northern Ireland. There has been, I think we released a report there at the end of last year which, which highlighted the, 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 the deficiencies in the number of pharmacists. So it is about looking at the other members of the pharmacy team to take on additional roles. Um, so undoubtedly, and I think possibly as, as, as we go forward here, just in the, in the immediacy of the, of the COVID uh, situation, there, there may well be changes that the public will, will have to recognise that we have to introduce around maybe elements of the blister packs, around the supply of some of the medicines. This is being done to, to try and maintain the core service of getting medicines to patients. And this is where I think as well, there's a societal role here. I think you know there is there has to be uh, you know friends, neighbours, family members, etc., etc., rallying around. And I think we are starting to see that here in Northern Ireland, and you know people will need more support with their medicines from family members, etc., etc. So it is a it's a broad approach, but community pharmacy will continue to look after. We know those patients, we know what they need, and whatever patients will will need, we will prioritise. In terms of upskilling staff. Mm -hmm. No matter how many people you get to fill the blister packs, every item must be checked by a qualified pharmacist. Mm. So yes, there's a, a value in upskilling staff to prep, but it must be double checked by a pharmacist before it leaves the premises. And that's right and proper. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to ask the clerk if there are any uh, questions or comments from Sinead Bradley, who's working remotely. So again, Sinead, I'd like to thank you for your uh, briefing and to thank the community pharmacists for serving us all. She says she shares a concern that due to the small staffing numbers, swift access to testing is required to keep the service functioning. And comments that society as a whole is dependent on your network and your business being sustainable. Two questions then. What attempts have community pharmacy made to date to ensure that the chemists and members of staff are enabled to exercise social distancing? Has there been any financial support from the department to facilitate this? Second question, in this emergency situation, can pharmacies access loose paracetamol that is not sealed in blister packs? She recognises that this is not ideal in normal times. Um, well, I think you probably saw there was a piece in the news during the week about the measures that are undertaken. Um, in my pharmacies, I've implemented post office style counters to, to allow that social distancing. In other pharmacies, they've put demarcations on the floor that at metre intervals that would keep people mm. sort of apart, nearly X's, stand on this X and stay away from other people. Um, there's been control of entry into pharmacies, so maybe one or two at a time. There's a range of things which are suitable for various pharmacies in various locations. In terms of the funding, no, that has been borne by the business itself and currently there has not been anything met from the, from the department or the, uh, the government. Um, I'm sorry, can you read the third question again? It was in relation to paracetamol. I think it was, yeah. It was paracetamol. Um, paracetamol is available in dispensing packs, but currently that isn't a, a facility to repackage and distribute. And um, We're looking at the minute at a, a service that allows us to repackage and prepare paracetamol for sale. I think Jared will probably elaborate. Yeah, I, I think you know the, the technicalities and the legalities around medicines are such that smaller packs can be sold, larger packs can't. And therefore, we're constrained by the legislation, uh, and there are workarounds being developed here at the minute to try and fast track um, supplies of the packs that can be sold into community pharmacies, and we're hoping that that comes through very quickly. I think what all of this is, shows us is that as a profession and maybe as a wider health service, we need decisions made quickly in this situation. And I was struck by, I think I mentioned it earlier, I was struck by one of the doctors in the World Health Organization who is involved in pandemic planning and, and management across the world for the last 20 years. And he was saying, if you're looking for perfection, you will fail. Speed is off the essence. And that's where we are now. We need speed on a range of things here. And. You know, I'm not going to reiterate them, but we need that speed. Um, and you know, pharmacists will they, they the the safety and the health and well-being of their patients is paramount. So that will always be a given. And therefore, whatever changes, whatever adaptations are being carried out in pharmacies or in relation to the supply of their medicines, it is done with their interests and their health and well-being at our at, at the heart of it all. Um, so you know, that assurance is there. Um, in terms of 
the supply of medicines, we will try and, and facilitate the patients as best as we can. And, you know, as I said, we have no option but to buy the more expensive medicines in. We have no choice. Otherwise, we just say to the public, you don't have, we can't get your medicines at the price that it's, it's normally available at. We do that. This is where we're saying to the department and the board, you need to recognise that we have costs in there in relation to the, the supply of the medicine. So that element, we need assurance on, on that, and we need assurances around the additional costs, whether um, the social distancing, the additional staff is, is, another, is two of those elements. Okay. Listen, thank you very much for uh, coming today again. Uh, we appreciate the concerns. It's good to have all those concerns on the record now, recorded, and we'll ensure, and um, I know the Minister will be paying attention, um, and we'll ensure that uh, we follow up all of these issues uh, with the Department. Yeah. And can I just wish you all the best going forward, and again, say thank you so much to you and to all of your staff who are pulling out all the stops to serve the community. It's yeah. greatly appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, members, so um, I think we can presume that uh, you will all want to invite the department to provide an official brief on the issues raised today. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Can I make a few points? I have a few direct questions to the department, so I don't know if it's best to ask them now or to wait till the end. Or uh, Take the Direction. I mean, obviously, questions of, you know, we all know questions uh, from individuals have been suspended, so we need to do whatever we can in whatever the best way possible. It might be part of a bigger conversation just a little bit later in the agenda, if you don't okay. mind, Jer, if you hang on to those, Thanks. and we'll deal with that when, when that comes. But for now, then, we're, we'll ask the department to, to officially brief us on the issues raised today. Okay, thank you. Um, Colm, you have no comment to make or anything? No, Okay, thank you. Okay, members, I'm going to refer you to uh, departmental correspondence at tab 5.1 of the table papers regarding the emergency coronavirus bill in Westminster. This is a preliminary information, uh, this is a preliminary information on the contents of the bill, which will be introduced in Parliament uh, this week. And I'm just going to refer to the, the clerk now for some further advice in relation to that legislation. Um, so members may have seen that the order paper from Monday makes reference to a possible legislative consent um, motion uh, no order paper has been issued on Tuesday as yet, um, so we're still waiting for confirmation of any dates and of the laying of uh, an LCM. If it is laid in the course of the day, uh, we will be in touch to try to arrange uh, an additional committee meeting, so staff members would wish to agree that they're content to, to do that as required. Members happy enough, so whether that whether that additional meeting would be Monday or whenever, I think it would be appropriate that we make ourselves available. Mm -hmm. Happy enough. Okay, Colm? Yep. Thank you. That's great. Uh, members, I uh, want to refer you to the memo from the Speaker to Committee Chairs at tab 5.2 of Table Papers. This is in relation to Assembly business um, in current circumstances, and this will impact on our committee business. We'll consider this under the Forward Work Programme. Um, on to item 7, which is the SR 2020-24, the Food Information Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. I refer members to tab 7 of the pack. 
This SR provides for the enforcement of the EU legislation requiring food business operators to note the country of origin or the place of provenance of the primary ingredients of a food product so that consumers may make more informed choices about the food they eat. The committee considered the SL1 policy document for this rule at its meeting on the 12th of March 2020 and inquired about the position in the Republic of Ireland. In uh, response to the inquiry was received yesterday and has been included in the table pack at 2.1. In the response, the Food Standards Agency has confirmed the regulations being considered by the committee will come into effect throughout the whole of the EU, including the Republic of Ireland, on the 1st of April 2020. So, as the committee has received the information it requested, are members now content to approve the SL1? Yep. Okay. And are members content to consider the associated statutory rule which was included in the committee meeting papers issued for, to members on Monday? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, there have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee. The examiner of statutory rules has no issues to raise. So, have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? And if not, can I ask members to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 254, the Food Information Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule? Great. Great. Okay, moving on to eight members. SL 1, the Food Information Amendment number 2, Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Item 8, uh, and I refer the members to tab 8 of the pack. The Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to improve information to consumers about food allergens and or ingredients which cause food hypersensitivity or intolerances in foods which are pre-packed for direct sale or PPDS. The SR will require food business operators to label such PPDS foods with the name of the food and the full list of ingredients on the packaging with the allergens emphasised. The SR is proposed to come into operation on the 1st of October 2020 and is subject to negative resolution. Negative resolution. Uh, so are members content that the Department makes a statutory rule? Okay, thank you. So moving on to correspondence at uh, item 9. Can I refer the members to tab 9 of the pack and table papers and to correspondence memo at tab 9.1? I want to draw attention to one item. Item 9.4 is a response from the Department to the Committee's request for information on the recording of waiting times for GP in-house counselling services. It refers to a range of services offered and advises that clinical need determines priority but does not commit to monitoring. Are members content to note or are there any comments? Well, Chair, I think the, the main point would be this is the sort of stuff I think we all, well, I certainly think that needs to happen, so it's maybe stuff that we really do need to feed in there whenever the mental health strategy is being developed as something going forward. So for now, possibly, but yeah, we can't just let it go with that. Okay. Colin, any comments? Yeah, yeah I, I think, think, I think it was like we were back in that. Give us more detail or give us more about that. Yeah, I think I would be in agreement with Colin that um, we're not even seeing a, a kind of a willingness to, to want to to do this at monitoring, and I think that's of vital importance. So, are we content that we um, uh, the clerk words uh, response that we seek more information, or um, I'm not sure how you'd actually word that. Uh, I think they could ask that. I can engage with members on their concerns and try to pull together a letter representing those concerns, perhaps. There was a campaign, I think PPPR had a whenever they were doing some, some work around this, and I wrote to the department at the time. My concern is that in the midst of everything else that's going on, this is maybe yeah. something that they will not prioritise. So yeah. It's maybe something we can write now, put on record, but I think we will on have to return finger. to. So we could maybe uh, say that we're not content with the, the, with the response, but understand the current situation. But the, for in terms of future planning, we believe it's important or whatever. Okay. Yeah, that's probably the best. Yeah, that's worth that for us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. In the current situation here, 
And it's not something really we want to talk about and flag up publicly because you can influence people when you start to talk, I guess. But the current situation is going to create more and more mental health issues. Yeah. And, and search and suicide is a real possibility. And I think we, you know, we've got to be just aware of that, that that's, yeah. we can't just put mental health on the back burner because it is going to be extremely relevant in the, in the coming weeks, coming days, in fact. There's no doubt. OK, well, we'll leave it with the clerk to um, come up with a, a response that we can send back to the department on that particular issue. So are members otherwise content with the proposed actions as noted in the correspondence memo? OK, thank you. And can I draw the member's attention? Sorry, Colm, go ahead. I just want to raise the issue and I'm raising that in the critical time issues as well. I'm wondering if we may have made that issue. Okay, well, I was actually just going to come on to that. Let me say um, to draw the members' attention to the second table in tab 9.1 of the list of correspondence issued. Um, members will note the correspondence to the committee letter relating to contaminated blood and financial support. It was due on the 9th of March. Uh, so I was going to seek your um, comments or suggestions on that. And we already, I, don't, I couldn't quite make that out. Could, Colin, could you repeat what you were saying there in your uh, comments on the, the letter um, relating to the contam contaminated blood, please? Yeah. Um it's just that that's a particular concern with very, very limited people get those payments out to um, affected people. So I was looking to know if we had a discussion about what, how we then address that. Okay, you're breaking up, but I think what you're saying is that um, given the, the limited time left until the end of the year, that the issue isn't currently resolved or it doesn't appear to be resolved and that we should actually go back to the department to ensure that it is resolved and very timely before the end of the financial year? Yeah. Okay. I'm just happy enough with that. Okay, then. Uh, we're moving on to the forward work programme and uh, can I refer you to the draft forward work programme at tab 10 of the pack? In light of the Speaker's memo, the committee will need to reconsider its forward work programme. Members, I think it would be also useful to discuss handling of the large numbers of queries that we're all receiving in relation to COVID-19. I'm sure members do not wish to overwhelm the department at this critical time, yet there are important issues that merit consideration. And I'm not talking about individual or constituency cases, which I know we've already agreed to keep away from the committee, and that's appropriate. Where possible, we could use our weekly discussion on the forward work program to agree a couple of priority topics on which we would like the department to brief us the following week, whether in Skype or in person. Uh, an oral briefing and discussion may provide the fastest response with the minimum of bureaucracy. There may be a small number of issues on which it is better to write the department. So really this, this is the part here where we're really looking for a direction where you think we should be going with this because it's obviously, it's very, it is very difficult to deal with in the current climate, Jerry. Sure, just a couple of points on this, if you can bear with me. Uh, uh, there's a lot of concern from what I'm hearing amongst people about the department's approach in some aspects of this, um, and even the executive. I mean, that's reflected in people's parents' um, basically response to take kids out of school, and for some board of governors to close schools themselves. So that's a reflection, I think, of the, uh, the approach that hasn't been taken so far. And I think there's three uh, crucial points that I think the department should get back to us on as a matter of urgency. One is around the medical advice, because we were told for the best part of two, three weeks that we were following the medical advice, but we've seen a different approach taken obviously in the south. Um, and there was a suggestion yesterday when I was in Dublin that the chief medical officers are in constant contact. So I think we should ask as a committee what was that medical advice. And I want to ask that that is uh, published because I think the public need to be reassured that the appropriate uh, advice is being followed. I think the second point is on testing. 
World Health Organization's message is test, test, test. And I'm very, very concerned um, that we sure that it's not being done. Uh, there's so little of it. Uh, so I think we should ask the department uh, what plans are being done. I know you said there's, there's measures in place. I think we should ask for the detailed plan of measures to uh, increase and allow for more testing to take place. Uh, in the south, there's um, stadiums uh, being provided for uh, drive-through testing. Is there measures in place for that to be expanded uh, here? Um, why are, are the samples going to England? If that's the case, can they be tested here in a much more rapid uh, fashion? Um, finally, the, um, uh, there's a shortage of ICU beds and ventilators. Um, the south of Ireland, as far as I understand, is one of the, the, the leading biggest producers of ventilators, um, certainly in Europe, if not across the world. Has there been a substantial order put in place to purchase, to require, to procure those those um, those ventilators? Um, so I think these these are questions that I have, but I mean, people are concerned that, um, you know, there's not enough being done. I mean, we are that already, but the lack of PPE equipment. So I think from my perspective, I want to obviously support the department as much as possible, but I think there's key questions that, uh, frankly, they're not, they're not answering. So uh, I would appreciate if they could be related to the department and a response uh, to those questions were, were provided. Did the minister not? Sorry, announce, one second, uh, Alan. One second. Just follows in first. Sorry. Is it a follow-on point? I'm happy to wait. Yeah, it's just that in terms of the ventilators, uh, I, I thought the minister gave a, a statement in the House that he had ordered 40 that were due to be delivered within 28 days. So I think maybe you should... Check that. I quite clear recollection of hearing him saying that, and the, it may have been in response to a question, question time in the house. But he said it was 40 ventilators ordered, on order. Okay. Well, I'm sure we can find that out. I, I know that certainly I saw something earlier. Actually, it might even have been a family member passed it on. Uh, some kind of information out there where there were um, large. Um, Industry people com That's coming right. coming together um, yep. in in a fantastic way to actually to yep. provide the, the templates and the parts and yep. to actually assemble the, to to make these ventilators. So I think there's there has been a very good response. I think to that call by government I think actually for help there is to a worldwide produce demand for them. Yeah, I mean, everybody's looking. By absolutely. Them. Uh, Paula, thank you. Um, Paula, no, thank no, you're you. fine. Um, no, I, I think Ger uh, sorry, Jerry has, has covered some of some of what I was going to ask. I think that the concern I have is that you know you can be tested, and then there's a tick box. But then, like some of these community pharmacies, you could be working all week, and so I'm just wondering about even repeat. You know, once they probably get the systems in place, and it might be easier then to, you know, more periodically. Because I'm, I think their concern is, as um, Pauline had said, there you can go from house to house. You know, so you could nearly, it's just very, very vulnerable. I think the PPE is obviously the the, the main priority. Um, my mother-in-law um, was asked by her care worker, who was the father-in-law, um, "Do you want me to wear the mask?" And the mother didn't want to offend, so she said, "Oh no, it's fine. She didn't want to be rude." <laughs> So there, there's ways in which we need to just really tighten this up because obviously if people are old and infirm and they don't want to, you know, they're, they're very old school. I think that the, the training for the for the frontline workers is, is, is a paramount. And um, the other um, concern I have is the people who are taking taxis to hospital for things like dialysis or where the where there's just no capacity within the private uh, ambulances and you know taxi drivers are now refusing to take them. So there's some services where people are being affected because the testing isn't going on. So I'm just concerned about the whole ripple effect. I don't know why we would fit this into this, but in terms of just some of the outlying conditions, I think that there are people whose health could be deteriorating because um, all the priorities on the urgent cases. So yeah, and the obviously there are many, 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 many questions that we will all have an issue. But I think that the, the problem or what we need to deal with right now is is how do we as a committee deal with those queries? How do I mean, to me, coming out of today's meeting, there's two main issues, and that's on the concern uh, about testing and PPE. Yeah. For you know, I think if the department are limited in how they can respond, mm -hmm. I think if we are prioritising the questions we're asking, that will be a help to the department. I would imagine whether do we do that in in writing or. Obviously, then there's the clerk will come and advise us, or or do we um, try to encourage them to send a representative each week, each week if possible, who can answer generic questions for us, mm -hmm. so that we're not overburdening the department either. But I'll refer to the clerk, and I think Colin wants to come in. Colin, sorry, I don't want to yeah. forget about you there. 
Yeah, I think, I think for me, what we've been flagging is the issue of decision making, leadership, and decision being made in the way. That affects both of the sectors we've heard earlier. We have now seen better action on the schools issue, and we welcome that, and I think it's good to be dependent. But we do need to see similar action around testing and around the provision of PPE. It, it may be the case that regulations can be relaxed to bring in people who have back in and I think we should just leave that up. Okay, so some of that did break up columns. So if you want to email in that full point so that we have it for our records, okay? Thank you. Sure, can I, I can I agree with your suggestion. I think we should have somebody from the department every week. You know, this is kind of moving. I'm, getting, I'm losing kind of messages every day. I'm sure everybody's the same. So I think as a general rule going forward, I'd like to propose or suggest if I can with somebody from the department um, and we can tell our questions accordingly if, if, if people agree with that. Yeah. Clark, I just want to check, in the interest of the person being well briefed and having the opportunity to prepare answers, are you also agreeing with the Deputy Chair's point that if you agree today what your priority issues are for answers, so what I've got here is, I think, testing and PPE, yeah. is that the committee's wish then to invite someone next week to try to answer on those particular two issues and then prioritise issues going forward on that? I agree with that and could we, could we decide on a weekly basis after every committee can we decide the week following who we want or what sort of avenue we want to um, hone in on? Is that can we do that as a, as a way of going so forward? I'll explore that with the department on your behalf. Thank you. Thank understanding, you. of course, in the present crisis. Yeah. We'll have to see what they say yeah. they can manage. Yeah. And I, I think it's important that we understand that if the department can um, agree to that request, that would be really good. But we need to understand that uh, you know, it, it might say if it's only one person uh, that they may not have all the answers, but I just want to put on record that we could be understanding and at the end of the day, the main thing is that the communication lines remain open and that we deal with these very serious queries as, as best we can in, in very trying circumstances. Okay. Right, okay. Um, so the, the clerk will explore them with the department and uh, see what, what she can do in terms of um, seeking briefing. Uh, on those particular aspects, that's the testing and the um, PPE in particular to uh, in dealing with COVID-19. So we'll leave that with the clerk to take forward. Um, members, views on our wider forward work programme in light of changing circumstances. Um, do, do members, so I'll throw out some questions, do members want us to, to scale back normal business for the next few weeks or are you content? to seek a briefing on the search plan, possibly for the 2nd of April, if already requesting an update on care homes, farms issues next week. Uh, do members want to uh, suggest other sectors or organisations from which community, or sorry, committee should seek a briefing in coming weeks? Uh, and are members otherwise content to note the forward work programme? So any other comments on, on how we go forward from now? Um, well, I think that some of the people have come, coming up with very important information, but right now it's probably not a priority. I think I'd like to hear from the, the trusts themselves. I think very early in our last mandate, or um, before, before the three years anyway, um, you know, the chief executives came along and gave an update, so I'd really like to hear about some of those operational issues. Okay. I think that's the dialysis is, is one of them, for example. Um, but I, do, I, I think we need to um, certainly hear from the department. And I also would like to hear from the GPs who are obviously in, in, in the front line as well. So, again, Members, Alan. I think, Chair, that uh, you know, we've, we've heard the Speaker mm -hmm. is, is scaling down our activity within the Assembly, and it may be only one day a week. And uh, you know the, the scrutiny that we're all going to have as, as, as just as individual members is going to be decreased and suppressed a little bit because of the circumstances. Um, but I think that the, particularly this committee, uh, it's important that we continue to try and operate as long as possible. Uh, but I think we should be concentrating on all of the routine stuff that we have laid out for the next three or four weeks, I think should be totally deprioritised and we should be concentrating um, absolutely on the 
you know, these issues, all these things that we've heard today. We can write letters. I think we need people sitting up there that we can direct these questions to and get direct answers and tease out a letter. You can't forensically examine a letter, really, you know, whereas you have them sitting here, you can be more forensic about the things. So I think, yes, we, we as a committee, we keep operating. We're an important committee. And we may be the only scrutiny uh, that's going to be offered uh, politically on this COVID-19 over the next four, six, eight, ten weeks as things develop. So I think we should really just absolutely concentrate on on that and, and things like the GPs where we, we hear, let's hear from the front line, let's hear what's happening out there and what we yeah. can suggest or and it's, nice. it's obviously It is difficult too because, I mean, the best bill in the world, no matter who the, what witnesses you would want to bring to this committee, we may be overrun by circumstance where they personally are not able to attend or uh, or may not know, wish to or may not wish to uh, for for uh, personal reasons so i think it's it's a difficult job for the committee staff to kind of keep on top of um, everything is so fluid and moving so fast so i think we would like to see people up in front of us where possible but that that may be more and more may, difficult may we may maybe only meet rather than to take evidence we just meet the talk to discuss, uh, yes. to share concerns, things that we are hearing on the ground, and uh, yeah, okay. if, if it's even only for that purpose, yeah. it doesn't have to be the grandstanding of, of witnesses. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we can. Absolutely. Colin. Yeah, I agree. I think we need to clear space to play our role in assisting everyone else in terms We are. We are ready to do everything we can to make sure they are part of the Thank you for that, Colm. Okay, the members content enough that we can go forward on that basis. Um, moving on to uh, 11, which is any other business. Do members have any other business? Nope. I just say that I think Colm has made a very good case this morning for better broadband uh, <laughs> coverage where he lives. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Colm, we appreciate your, appreciate your efforts to be here with us today. Thank you for that. Um, so on to 12, date and time and place of next meeting. The next meeting will take place at 10.30am on Thursday, 26th of March 2020 in the Senate Chamber in Parliament Buildings. Thank you very much. Thanks. Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.